Okay, Mr. Warden, we're live, so the meeting is yours, sir. Excellent. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Glad to have you all here with your bright, smiling faces. <laughs> here, squeeze out a smile or two. Uh, I just want to say good morning to everyone. It's August 12th, and I want to welcome everyone to this County Council uh, meeting. I call the meeting to order. Um, and I should caution before we get into uh, business, we've got an extremely heavy uh, agenda. So I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, you will see your warden uh, pushing things along today. I don't want to stifle uh, conversation, but we certainly have a lot of business uh, to attend to. And it's going to be a long day. And you might find me being a little pushy in terms of uh, moving the agenda along. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Thank you and good morning, Council. Um, we have all members of Gray County Council in attendance. I just see all uh, Councillor Soever joining us. So all 18 are here, Mr. Wharton. Excellent. Uh, welcome all. So we'll start with the uh, <clears throat> land acknowledgement. Let's just get things together here. So we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and the Inuit whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all as treaty people live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Item number four, is there any declaration of interest from anyone, pecuniary or otherwise? Uh, seeing none, we'll proceed on. I would just ask that you declare uh, if during the course of the meeting, you find that you need to. Um, item number five <clears throat> is uh, adoption of minutes. 5A is the County Council and Committee of the Whole Minutes, which are dated July 22nd, 2021. Uh, they are moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Any discussion there? Uh, Councillor Desai. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, I'm just going through the through the report section here. Um, the one thing that pops out right up on right, right at the start is that there was a, a projected year in deficit of six hundred thirty thousand six hundred dollars. Um, now I'm, I'm I know my numbers aren't exact, but that is very close to. Um, 1% uh, tax increase as of last year's budget. My question through you, through you Mr. Warden, is how, how is that um, deficit funded? Is that through uh, reserves or, or how do we make up that deficit? Uh, I do have further questions, but I, I don't know if you want me to go through them or if you want me to... Um... No, we'll, we'll perhaps go to Mary Lou for that question and I'll come Thank back you. to you. Mary Lou? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, Councillor Desai, could could you point me to where you're you're seeing you're talking about, please? Definitely. So it's in the in the minutes of the long term care agenda. It's under uh, reports LTCR CM seventeen twenty one. So right uh, it was the financial. I apologize. Uh, we're dealing with uh, item five A. <clears throat> oh goodness! I apologize. I skipped ahead. I'm no so sorry. I for some reason I heard long term care. I do apologize, Mr. Warden. No worries, uh, but Mary Lou is prompted and she will take a peek at those minutes. So, any other uh, questions um, uh, on the uh, County Council and Committee of the Whole minutes, uh, July twenty second? And seeing none, I will call the question. Then, is there anyone opposed to approval? That's carried. Thank you very much. Now we're on to. Item 5B, the Long-Term Care Committee of Management Minutes, which are dated July 27th. Uh, that is moved by Councillor O'Leary and seconded by Councillor Woodbury. Now, Councillor Desai, <clears throat> your question is uh, before Mary Lou. Mary Lou, do you still need to be directed on? No, we're good. I'm going to pass that over to Joanna as she's the uh, lead for long-term care. Joanna, it appears that you're muted. I don't know. Oh, oh you're okay, Joanna. I am okay. Thank you. Good there morning. We go. There we go. <laughs> Good morning. Um, yes, through, through you, Mr. Warden. Yes, I'm happy to answer that. So, yes, this 
Um, I did present this report to the Long-Term Care Committee of Management in, on July 27th, and this is definitely a bigger deficit than we would ever have hoped. And I did reassure the committee at that time that we're going to try to do everything in our power to reduce the amount of this deficit. Um, we're continuing our cost containment measures. We're working closely with purchasing finance and HR to ensure we continue responsible uh, spending. We also committed to reviewing capital projects to see if any could be deferred that could help fund this deficit. Um, but one of the most important uh, preventative measures that we can take is to um, for staff to be diligent to ensure that um, COVID expenditures are recorded in the COVID department lines. If we if we fail to do that, then we're losing out on any funding um, that we could claim for those COVID expenditures. So so far, staff have been doing a really fantastic job. By, by virtue of ensuring that those costs are captured appropriately. We do a line by line review every month with the, with the uh, executive directors and the department managers to review expenditures and invoices and to ensure that no COVID expenses end up in the regular departments. Um, and we wanna ensure that um, we, we do um, record them properly. So we do, um, we do hope that we don't have as large a deficit. We do, um, if we do uh, have a deficit, we plan to fund that through the reserves. Does that answer your question, Councillor Desai? It, it does, thank you, uh, Joanna. The, I guess the building on that question, you mentioned one of the biggest, and the report mentioned it, mentions it as well, that one of the biggest uh, causes for the deficit is the COVID expenditures. Um, and I just want to confirm this, and I, I think uh, based on what you've just said, I do know the answer, but I just want to confirm, we would be, um, would we be eligible for, for reimbursement of those? I know at the lower tier levels, we've been told that if there are any COVID related expenditures that we could uh, qualify for, for the grants. Um, is, there this, is there a similar uh, stream for long-term care? That's a great question. Thank you very much for asking that. So we do have COVID prevention and containment funding that we receive through the Ministry of Long-Term Care. So they give us regular allocations of this funding. At this point, the funding does not cover all of our expenditures. Um, however, the ministry did last year, um, did reimburse us everything that we spent. We don't know if that will happen in 2021. We do have um, safe restart funding that we could use to offset some of these expenditures. Um, I did want to mention, though, that the deficit that we're facing, most of it doesn't actually relate so much to COVID. It relates to reduced funding based on our case mix index, as well as reduced funding for the five bed licenses that we um, were um, were, offered, were given in 2020 that were unexpectedly pulled from us in 2021. Um, that question, Councillor Desai? Madam CAO. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Joanna. I was just going to make that point that you just made, and just to draw Council's attention to the fact that we do have a delegation with the Ministry of Long-Term Care, and one of the points in that delegation is with regard to these in-year changes to funding. Um, it's very difficult for any municipality to um, be able to budget and plan appropriately when you get significant in-year changes to budget. Um, as well, you know, the, the COVID funding is, is to be specifically used for COVID-related expenses. So we do need to be somewhat cautious in the way that we um, put expenditures against those lines just to make sure that, that we're not ever at risk of having those expenditures clawed back from the province because they believe that they were inappropriately assigned there. Thank you, Councillor Desai. Thank you, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, um, CAO, and uh, thank you, Warden Hanks. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to bring up is, is my concern with the deficit being funded from the reserves. Uh, there is no other place we can fund it from. Uh, the reason it causes me concern is that during last year's budget, Council voted uh, to um, to take money from reserves to artificially lower the uh, the, the tax increase. Um, that reserve money could have gone towards whatever the deficit ends up being. And I do hope it's as low as possible. And I know the staff are going to be working as hard as they can to uh, bring that number as close to zero as possible. But I just want to draw your attention to that fact that we should have looked foreseen uh, expenses that would have, or deficits that would have come up during the year 
um, when we when we deliberated the budget at the start of the year. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Thank you. Um, any other uh, questions from council members? Seeing none, then perhaps it's time to call the question. Is there anyone opposed to approval of these minutes? I see no hands, therefore it's carried. Thank you very much. Moving on, uh, item 5C is a long-term care Committee of Management closed meeting uh, minutes of July 27th. That's moved by Councillor Mill and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Um, if we have questions, we have to <laughs> obviously uh, going to close. Uh, so I'll call the question. Anyone opposed to approval of those uh, minutes? And seeing no hands, I'm gonna say that that too uh, is carried. <clears throat> okay, we do not have any need for a closed uh, meeting. Um, and item number seven is dealing with uh, bylaws. Um, there, <clears throat> there are three of them and uh, they're moved by Councillor Mill and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Are there any questions with respect to those bylaws? Seeing no questions, then I'll call the question. Anyone opposed to approval? No one being opposed, that too is carried. Thank you very much. We're now moving on. Uh, to good news and celebrations. Does anyone have any good news and celebrations they would like to tell us about? Uh, Councillor Soever. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I'd like to just advise the, the council that on uh, Saturday, I was able to attend the um, celebration of the expansion of the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail and, uh, and the warden was there as well. Um, as was uh, B Bill Walker and the, the Mayor of Collingwood. So this was an event held at the village. And so this is, uh, you may have seen some of the signs up around your communities for the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail over the last few years. Uh, so this is another 600 uh, kilometers that was extended uh, through S Simcoe, uh, Gray and Bruce, um, goes up all the way up Georgian Bay, uh, up to Tobermory and then back down the uh, Huron shore. So this is a great uh, bicycling experience. In fact, in a book um, that's published, it's number five of the great cycling adventures in the world is the, the Waterfronts Trail. So this is not only here, this is just the 600 um, kilometers that's in our communities, but I think there's about 3000 kilometers in total along all of the Great Lakes. So this was a, a Every year uh, when there's a new section that opens up, there's a ride organized. So this year there were 70 riders that are doing the entire 600 um, kilometers. And I understand they stopped in Owen Sound as well in Meaford and uh, other places along the way. So um, this is a great addition to our community and uh, certainly brings um, you know the type of tourism from all over the world that uh, contributes to our economy. So that's good news. And then after that, to relax, I went to the opening of the Soma Leaf uh, Marijuana Dispensary in the town of Thornbury. And uh, that, that is another new business that has uh, popped up over the course of the pandemic. Um, so that, again, is uh, good news. Our economy is growing and um, certainly new businesses are arriving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Soever. Uh I'm glad that you uh, mentioned that uh, bicycle trail. I also want to acknowledge that, uh, first of all, our staff who put in a lot of work. Uh, and it was a really, really excellent uh, day, but I know a lot of work went into making that happen. First of all, bringing it uh, to Great County and secondly, pulling up, secondly, pulling off the day uh, with such success. It was just amazing. So thanks to our staff. I also want to acknowledge uh, that my colleague, Warden Cornell uh, from Simcoe was also in attendance uh, for the launch. And later in the evening, uh, Councillor Boddy uh, was present and gave a, an exceptional speech uh, for the dinner uh, that was held. So thank you. Uh, next is Councillor McQueen. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, thank you, County Council, for allowing me to speak. And I just want to say a, a quick comment with uh, the Mayor of the Mountains. He said he had a relaxing time. I wonder if it was before or after the event uh, that he attended, but uh, we won't uh, say any more of that one. Just tongue in cheek. A couple things, uh, Mr. Warden. Um, so uh, there was a huge announcement uh, for the redevelopment of the Collingwood Hospital uh, a couple of days back where they were moving on to their next stage of their redevelopment. And the Minister of Health was 
in attendance along with myself and representatives from the area mayors. And uh, it does, the Colony Hospital, as we are aware, does serve part of Great County. And so they're moving forward to their next stage of their redevelopment for that. Uh, I call it the Southern Georgian Bay Regional Hospital versus the Collingwood Hospital because it is serving a bigger area. The other part I want to raise today is um, we do have the upcoming uh, AMO conference. And um, again, I think kind of council to allow me to be a representative on on the AMO board. And, and as the chair of uh, County Caucus, uh, we do have a lunch, um, a virtual lunch uh, session on Monday between 11.30 and 12.30. But I was tasked for searching out a speaker. So I thought for a few minutes and uh, I spoke to uh, Dr. Era, is our uh, medical, of, medical officer of health for our region. And he was uh, very gracefully uh, uh, saying yes to speaking. So he will be our speaker at that lunch. So if you're able to attend that virtual lunch for the county caucus part of, of that Monday event, that if you can attend, that would be great. Uh, he's going to be doing a slide presentation of a few highlights of, uh, you know, with regards to uh, our experience here in Grey Bruce with regards to COVID and maybe may focus on a bit more on the uh, Delta variant, which we, our region and the Waterloo region has experienced a little bit more sooner than some of the other regions in the province. So anyway, uh, he will be speaking at that. And if you're able to show your support or throw the, throw the odd question at him, maybe, or however, but um, he will be attending that on Monday. So I'm not sure who's all attending the AMO conference, but um, I felt that was sort of a little bit of a check for Gray, Gray and Bruce uh, region. So anyway, thank you for that, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Deputy Warden. We'll turn next to Councillor Clumpus. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and good morning, County Council. Um, I just want to share a, a good news story that is bringing a lot of smiles to not only residents, but uh, all of our visitors who bike and walk on the Georgian Trail. We have a young man, Clayton Carbert, and his grade six uh, friends have been painting rocks and hiding them in various places throughout uh, our, our municipality. And his greatest achievement to date has been to start a rock snake on the trail. And it is an amazing uh, thing to see with all of these messages of hope and encouragement and positive thinking. Um, I can't tell you how long it is, but um, it, was, it was really quite a distance in, uh, in, in July. So it is growing daily. And not only that, but uh, the end, the tail of the snake has been started in Thornbury and is traveling to meet the head. So it's, uh, it truly is uh, an inspiration to see um, the efforts of these young people who are engaging in the community and uh, offering such uh, hope and inspiration to us all. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councillor Clumpus. And I once again have to give huge kudos uh, to the staff at Memorial Park where I've been staying for the last week. I'm still there, by the way, I leave Friday. Uh, and they've been uh, tremendous. And there was a beautiful uh, rock painting in campsite number nine where I'm staying, <laughs> by the way. Uh, so anyways, I just uh, love Memorial Park and uh, highly recommend it to anyone who has a trailer or would like to enjoy the outdoors and, uh, and the waterfront uh, facilities. Uh, next is Councillor Gamble. Yes, just a, an event that we're having in Chatsworth on September the 11th. It's a, an antique classic car event to raise money for our new hub and arena. Um, we've had a couple of runs on Wednesday night. We've had over 60 cars uh, at that. So we're looking probably on the 11th to probably in the area of 200 cars coming out if the weather co uh, cooperates with us. So it's a pretty exciting thing for Chatsworth. We're looking forward to it. So date, time, and location, Councillor Gamble? Yeah, September the 11th from 9 to 9. Uh, there will be beer gardens and entertainment along with the car show too. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Robinson, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and good morning to County Council and staff and those listening in. Um, I'm going to use this time as uh, an acknowledgement, uh, a thank you to West Gray Police Fire Public Works uh, for their quick response and uh, assistance during a major rain event which hit Durham on uh, Saturday evening. 
the localized storm cell over Durham measured 65 millimeters of rain, which caused excessive runoff and uh, roadway flooding. So we did have um, uh, one rural road sustained uh, major erosion uh, as a result of um, the uh, concentrated rain. It has been repaired. We do have other roadways that, that are being repaired at this time. And uh, several, several basements um, were flooded. So I just uh, um, want to thank everyone involved for uh, being safe. And uh, uh, we're um, obviously on uh, recovery. So thank you to all that were involved, including our citizens who uh, were absolutely resilient during this time. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Next is Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council. Uh, just a couple of things. September the 11th, coincidentally, West Gray Minor Hockey uh, is going to be holding their annual golf tournament. And we are doing that in Homestead, which is located in Southgate. So uh, if you want to go on to, uh, I figure we get a thumbs up over there. But go on to West Gray Minor Hockey uh, website, you can get the details for the tournament. Um, in addition, the Soggy Municipal Airport uh, this Sunday is a holding event uh, it'll be organized by Bert and Maria Hodgkins and it's called Hope Air and uh, Hope Air helps um, Canadians uh, with free travel and accommodations who have financial needs and require medical care from their homes and last year they uh, raised over seven thousand dollars so they are actively trying to pursue uh, achieving that if not better this year and the other thing that I have is I uh, just wanted to share with everyone, we continue to have uh, ongoing interest from pilots and other uh, people looking at uh, S the, the, the airport for uh, for uh, developing and building some more hangars. So things are happening. That's uh, that's good on the economic development front. Thank you. The good news. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Hutchinson. Um, uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I, I, I missed a couple things on your indulgence, and um, I think it was maybe raised at our last county council, but I'm not sure. But uh, we did have a kite festival that was happening in the Beaver Valley at the Twin Towers um, Kite Festival, but it has been moved to the ninth line of, of Euphrasia Kite Festival on September 18th and 19th. And uh, we have to work out a few details on the NEC part that we had planned to have it. But uh, anyway, we'll work on that through to next year. Uh, also, the municipality of Gray Highlands has, um, has entered into a conditional offer to sell the municipally owned Talisman lands, uh, very high level, very, um, you know, in the early stages of moving forward. But again, that's the municipal owned lands of Talisman that's, uh, and we'd entered into a joint venture with Think Compass back in March to move forward to some working on those, uh, those properties. But I do want to put a, sh a shout out to Steve Furness, uh, the um, uh, county staff economic development uh, individual who has helped uh, through the way on that. So I do want to put a, a word of uh, thank Steve on that. And also uh, a shout out to uh, Penny Colton, who has sort of uh, stepped up from her retirement and is looking after all our businesses and yours as well, Mr. Warden. And, uh, you know, a huge shout out to uh, Penny for that until we find a permanent, uh, a permanent solution for that position. And I'm, I know Penny is so good from my experience last year and others. It's uh, it's great that she was able. And so again, a big thank you to uh, Penny for, I'm sure you could echo that Mr. Warden. I'm sure I know you and I had a little conversation about that and it's, it's certainly great that uh, she's been able to come out of retirement to help us out. So again, a big shout out for there. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you. And certainly I would say Penny is worth a pound. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, sh sh uh, was, was that a dad joke? Um, <laughs> it was. <laughs> my, my eyes rolled to the back of my head, Mr. Ward. All right, we are on to item number nine, which is uh, adjournment. Adjournment has been uh, moved by Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, we are now adjourned. We'll take a second just to flip over to Committee of the Whole. Get my notes together here. <clears throat> okay. So we are now meeting as Committee of the Whole and I call this meeting to order. Is there any declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? Uh, seeing none, I would again say, if one comes up during the course of the meeting, I would ask you to make that declaration at that time. Um, item number three is uh, a delegation. We have Pam Hillier, 
who is the executive director of uh, 211 Services. Um, uh, and Anne Marie will be making that introduction. Good morning, Council. It's my pleasure um, to introduce the, uh, Pam Hillier, Executive Director of uh, Regional 211 for the Central East Ontario. Uh, Pam is here to give us a report, annual report on what 211 has been up to um, with, and their services. Uh, she's going to share some statistics and information about uh, 211. Uh, she's also going to fill us in on the role that 211 had in supporting the Grey Bruce Health Unit. Um, through telephone um, registrations uh, by providing additional telephone technology and people power to ensure a fast and efficient vaccine rollout. Uh, and we're, we're very thankful to Pam and her team um, for helping us out with that local registration. So I don't know if everybody knew, but when you called uh, Public Health uh, for assistance, um, it was Pam and her team that were behind all of that. So welcome, Pam. Yes, welcome, Pam. And I, uh, before you start, I would say for the viewing public, uh, uh, Pam's uh, PowerPoint presentation is uh, on the website under the agenda, uh, and I know that all of County Council does have it as well. Great. Pam? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, hopefully my screen sharing will work okay. Someone can let me know if it's not. So it's good to go. Thank We're seeing it. Great. Thank you very much for having me today, Warden and Council. I appreciate the opportunity to give a brief update. Um, and just for those who maybe watch this uh, recording in the future and aren't familiar with 211, I'll just start with a couple of just background pieces. Um, that 211 is a three digit dialing code assigned by the CRTC. Analogous is with 911, you call 911 for emergencies and 211 for essential services. So at a system level, 211 is this national brand that really is to handle high, call, high volume contact centers. And at the local level, uh, like the work we've done with the vaccine rollout and many other things in Gray County, uh, we get involved in a lot of different initiatives and programs that helps communities. So as part of our provincial system, we're one of six independent organizations that uh, share the infrastructure to provide the call center. So the calls flow across all six call centers. And then each of us as independent organizations look after the um, outreach, engagement, activities, and the resource database. So we kind of do three things, is our call center work, our database that supports the call center, as well as online directories, and then our business intelligence, the needs and trends uh, that we see through the call center. So my update will cover a little bit of each of these. So needless to say, last year was a little different year for us. And in 2020, uh, calls to the provincial 211 Ontario, that's all six contact centers, increased overall by about 40%. Our biggest challenge was keeping up to the changes in the database. Those, or, as organizations were adapting to how to um, deliver services to people uh, during shutdowns and, and opening up and different times it changes continually, it really challenged our database team and which resulted in our navigators on the phone line spending a lot more time in trying to locate and making sure they had the, the most recent information for the caller. Um, this kind of increased our call volume by about 50%. So typically our calls average five minutes and they went up to about 12 minutes in length. And that in itself resulted then in, in uh, a huge high um, uh, abandonment rate because people were then waiting longer in queue. So we had a combination of things that didn't go well for a little period for different periods of time during the year. Our team here in Collingwood, uh, our, our own experience during March and April was a 71% increase in call volume. So pretty significant. Uh, we did continue to receive uh, other surges in calls throughout the year. And right now we're about 25% higher uh, in call volume than previous to the pandemic. So our funding, thank goodness for emergency funding, and it really enabled us to hire some temporary staff for 15 months. And this slide is just a synopsis of the support we re received. And I just want to thank Gray County and, and your staff for the support we did get uh, for this emergency response here. This doesn't include the vaccine line. So just to look at some numbers from the provincial level, and I'll move down into the uh, local community level, um, you can see here uh, that during June, we had a 50% increase in calls and online, 
in the April period was 85% uh, where people were um, looking for that information themselves. What people were calling about during the first six months is located here. And you can see that the top needs provincially were food, huge increase in food need and income. We go down into our regional call center. That was that green map I showed you previously. You can see that um, again, the top two needs um, were, um, sorry, income and food again, uh, but now food was number two. Online, um, that green map, we, uh, the list on the right are the various local directories that our database supports, as well as our regional database. And we had 1.7 million page views last year. So lots of traffic for that online uh, service. Now, as we look at Gray County last year, the top 10 needs are listed here. And you can see the, the change between the two years and the highest increase was in the income request. Uh, for help. And food didn't make it onto the list, as you'll see locally. And I think that is indicative of the local response and the food services that is happening. And I think that rural communities have a different need than obviously the urban centers and food doesn't show in our local, our local numbers. So now as we're looking um, longer term into the recovery, it's going to be important for us to measure the gap between the needs that callers are presenting on the line and the needs of the community to respond. So we're able to use our data to show those gaps in service and then communities can use that as planning. So as an example, um, last year, the unmet needs for Gray County are listed here and the top one was housing, which is probably no surprise to those. Then we can look deeper into the data and look at under housing is what kind of housing questions were there. So the top was shelter and number two was rent payment, then moving assistance, things like that. So you can see what types of housing needs residents had. And then if we can look at why they had unmet needs and in the top one, I just picked two, homeless shelter, and the rent payment assistance. And I think it's obvious without shelter services, limited amount of emergency uh, beds, uh, those are the top needs. In the rent payment assistance, you can see the top need was they were ineligible. And they continue this year to have uh, individuals that are ineligible for service. So these types of data can help inform maybe policy or changes to um, eligibility for some programs as an example. This is just a snapshot of our online data that's live. So that red box in the bottom left, you can go there and drill down into each of your towns and cities to see the types of needs that are presented. And it shows you that in real time. And then the second one here is the unmet needs. So again, on that link, you can go in and kind of see what's happening in the community today. So just a bit of a picture from our data side of our work. <clears throat> In other news though, last year, uh, United Way Canada received $10 million in emergency funding to finally expand 211 service nationwide. So our first call center launched in 2002. So we've been a few years getting this far and uh, some of the good news coming out of, it, out of a really bad situation in our country. So good, good news all around for us at 211 on that side. And then as Anne-Marie mentioned was the, uh, the request we had to help public health. And I'll just kind of walk through a little bit of that scenario for us. So in February, uh, we were asked how we could support the health units vaccine rollout. Uh, we, we had many hiring, hiring challenges when we think, thought about what the needs were. Uh, it was really not clear how soon it would be needed, how busy it would be, how long it would be running, and how complex it would be. So we decided to take the plunge and use volunteers and we recruited 19 volunteers through nine Rotary Clubs in Bruce and Gray County. We couldn't use 211 as the access point because it'd be too confusing for the public as 211 wasn't the access point in most regions. So we set up and launched a toll-free vaccine line using our virtual call center technology and it enabled volunteers to use their own computers at home and it went live on March 15th. We did hire a project coordinator to oversee the volunteers and to attend the daily briefings with the health unit. Often daily meetings were not enough as changes came fast and furious. Volunteers were trained to use the health unit's local booking system and assist callers with their questions using a continually updated process chart. 
So this picture is um, a Rotarian, uh, Tony Sheard out of Southampton. And um, you can see here between March 15th and July 16th, uh, they answered almost 12,000 calls and contributed almost 1800 hours, averaging 109 calls a day. Pretty impressive. Uh, our team coordinator was Don Moore out of Walkerton. And not only were people calling surprised to be speaking to a local person, the people on the phones got great service and satisfaction out of helping their own community because Rotarians are helpers and they were really displaced, not being doing their usual work. And this was a really unique uh, way for them to help. On the computer screen is this process chart. So as different questions came in, the volunteers would follow uh, what information to provide and direct them um, as things constantly change throughout the va uh, vaccine process. So that line stopped, uh, I think last Friday. So we're just getting ready to do a, a, a final report on that. I just wanna thank Anne-Marie particularly and um, her helping us through this process. And she's been a great support for us. Um, and it's been a really fun project, something we never would have considered pre-pandemic. So now we're looking at what else could we do with a specialized line like this for seniors in our rural communities. So we're talking to uh, our local partners and seeing where, where this might go at the end of the day. The last little update I'll give you is really on the social determinants of health work. The last time I reported on this was in the fall of 2019 and we had rolled out a referral system with the paramedic program. And uh, last year we received 58 referrals from paramedics. And these are for patients that are um, in need of food and income and other supports. And we're able to connect about 50% of those patients to additional services. We do have plans to um, expand the e-referral process to all the family health teams in the community health center. Um, and once the pandemic work gets kind of rolled away and think kind of whatever back to normal looks like, we hope to um, embrace that, that partnership there. <clears throat> so that is um, the end. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. I have to say, I know uh, Don Moore from Walkerton very, very well. Fantastic guy, great to see. I had no idea the Rotarians were uh, yeah. doing that. That's, that's fabulous. Uh, questions, I see Councillor Potter. Thank you, not a question, just a comment that uh, I did use the uh, line that you're talking about to book my second COVID appointment and the person I talked to couldn't have been more helpful and more knowledgeable about, uh, I, was, I was so pleasantly surprised at how well uh, my call was handled uh, and my appointment was booked. We did run into a little bit of a snag, but he was able to deal with it. So he knew exactly what he was doing. So uh, kudos to the whole organization for, for bringing that together because it worked really well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Any other questions? <laughs> And it's interesting as well to see that uh, we've been hearing for years about uh, uh, housing. Uh, and uh, certainly this council has received that message uh, loud and clear, but the numbers are still uh, showing that that's where the need is, right? Okay, I don't see any other uh, questions. So with that said, Pam, I wanna thank you very, very much. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. Always nice to hear from you folks and congratulations on all your very good work. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye now. Okay, <clears throat> so where are we now? We are dealing with uh, moving on to item number four on the agenda now, uh, dealing with the consent agenda. Council, is there anything that needs to be pulled? We're looking at items 5A to J. Uh, Councillor Soever. Uh, you're muted, sir. Yes, I'd like to pull item C, the uh, um, development charges steering committee minutes, and also item G, the Blue Mountains resolution dated July 12th. Thank you. I've got C and G. And so I'll turn next to item uh, six, <clears throat> which is, uh, sorry, five, um, the consent agenda. 
is moved by Councillor Hutchison and seconded by Councillor Keaveney. Uh, with the exception of uh, C and G, is anyone opposed to approval? Uh, Councillor McQueen, are you opposed or do you have something to say? No, I just wanted to also pull the one. I'm just trying to find it on my device here with regards to the development charge steering committee minutes. I would like to pull that one as well. I think that's already pulled, uh, 5C. Oh, right? okay. I yeah. don't have the ABCs beside my agenda here. So thank you very no much. So 5C is already pulled. Okay, Great. so I've called the question. I see no one opposed. So I'm going to say that that is carried. <clears throat> Bear with me a quick sec while I find my place here. Okay, we're on to items uh, six. Six A uh, is our long-term care corporate uh, capital overview. Uh, Kim and uh, Mary Lou are on deck. This is moved by uh, Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor Columbus. Uh, Kim and Mary Lou. Thank you so much, Mr. Warden, and I'll, I'll start us off. Um, so good morning, Council. Uh, this report is coming forward as a result of new information about the estimated cost of the long-term care redevelopment projects and how the increased amount of investment required impacts the financial capacity of the county, future plans for other aspects of county operations, as well as the capacity of each of your municipalities to raise funds. As shared with the Redevelopment Committee last week, we've been advised to increase our per bed cost for the construction projects by 42% from 280,000 per bed to $400,000 per bed. As outlined in the report, Gray County has a long history of stable operations and taking a thoughtful and conservative approach to meeting our obligations. Fiscal responsibility is a core value in our strategic plan. At the present time, Gray is in good shape financially. We received clean audit results and our financial indicator results are in line with other upper tier municipal comparators. Best practice for assessing current financial health or the implications of future investment decisions are to look at three indicators. First of these is sustainability. Are your operations sustainable? Are you living within your means? And will additional spending help or hurt the organization to remain sustainable in the future? Second is flexibility. Do you have borrowing room? Can you take on debt responsibly without impacting your credit rating and the interest rate that you'll pay? Do you have the ability to meet lo loan obligations even if the interest rates were to raise over the term of the loan? And the third factor is vulnerability. How able are you now or would you be with the additional debt being considered to recover from a sudden financial shock? What would a significant loss of revenue or a significant increase in cost do to your financial health? The report provides details of our current status in each of these areas. At the present time, we can say we are sustainable and we have flexibility. All municipalities are very vulnerable to changes to the level of support we receive from other levels of government or unexpected catastrophic expenses. So I don't feel that we're not unique or different than any of our colleagues in that regard. Currently, Gray County carries $3.2 million in debt. Our capital plan identifies investments of $245 million required to maintain and improve our existing capital assets over the next 10 years. The projects that were listed in the 10-year capital plan that you received very recently are there because they are required to address regulatory or growth-related requirements, are part of the asset management plan, building condition assessment, or other evaluations. Gray's solid financial health has allowed us to self-finance projects and keep our costs down. Council has always directed money to be set aside in reserves and staff have scheduled projects to avoid spikes and swings in levy requirements. That certainty from the county is beneficial to your lower tier budget planning and timing. We know there are limits to the capacity of ratepayers to absorb tax increases. When the county is conservative with our spending increases, we leave room for member municipalities to meet their obligations. In addition to the projects in 10-year capital, there are other priorities and requirements that are either under development 
or on the horizon that need to be accounted for in the future. And I'll turn this over now to Mary Lynn. Mary Lou, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit first about uh, potential new capital spending. So in addition to the projects that have been identified in the 10-year capital forecast, there are other potential budget impacts that Council will be asked to consider in the future. This isn't a comprehensive list, but rather highlights some of the significant potential undertakings. Uh, the first is affordable housing, homelessness prevention, and supportive housing. There are an estimated 600 plus affordable housing rent geared to income units that would be required to address the housing wait list. Um, the cost to build units in today's dollars is approximately 300,000 per unit. And should the county undertake 600 units uh, without any upper level of government funding, this would require $180 million. Um, an estimate of $200,000 is an annual requirement for rent supplement assistance. Uh, the housing portfolio continues to age and will require an increase in funding to maintain the portfolio or fund debenture payments to redevelop. So currently we are not setting aside money to redevelop the portfolio. We are funding the maintenance of it. Funding would be required should the county support securing supportive housing facilities. Current provincial funding does not support the approximately $800,000 required for emergency stays and out of the cold program and additional outreach workers. The 2021 budget includes 1% funding to go to the affordable housing reserve. This will be a 2022 budget impact as the 2021 contribution was made from the one-time funding reserve. And in 1% in the 2021 budget is approximately $610,500. Next is great transit. As we know that the grant has been extended for two years and now runs until 2025. If we wish to continue the transit program beyond the grant, the cost in 2021 dollars is $732,000, plus the already $92,000 that's being funded from the levy for the Gray County Road 4 route. So that combined total is $824,200. There is a Gray County Transit Year in Review report later in the night meeting that requests support for including a levy contribution of $223,000 in the 2022 budget to provide more routes or more trips on existing routes. Should the county be interested in funding the route currently funded from Southgate's grant, this would require an additional $154,000 in 2021 dollars, and that would provide the current level of service. There are road exchange connecting link conversations. Pat Hoy had a report earlier in the year and this cost cannot be quantified until decisions are made on which where roads would be involved. Road improvements. The 10-year capital forecast uses best estimates and inflationary factors to determine current construction costs. And the example provided in the report demonstrates the impact if costs in the 2025 budget are 10% higher than estimated. We'd require $2.1 million in funding more or we would need to reprioritize projects. Uh, examples of infrastructure, if a bridge fails, we could be looking at a million dollars. Uh, one kilometer of road failure could cost between 1.2 million and 3.5 million, depending on the type of road, whether it's a rural, semi-rural, or an urban. Uh, weather events seem to be more extreme. Uh, Councillor Robinson mentioned the recent event of the flooding in Durham. It happened over the weekend and the challenges this puts on roads infrastructure. That ties to climate change. The draft climate change action plan discusses a variety of strategies and actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from both a county perspective as well as a community perspective. Items would include things like uh, electric vehicles and equipment in the county fleet, energy efficient retrofits and renewal energy at county sites. Community opportunities would be energy retrofits, electric vehicle charging stations, active transportation, a community change adaptation plan, coordinating with local municipalities on waste diversion, etc. 
And in order to undertake these initiatives, county and senior levels of government funding would be required. The impact of the province's plan to motor modernized delivery of social services is unknown and the resulting um, implication on the county's budget. Paramedic services. Um, Director McNabb's report on the consent agenda discussed the increase in call volume and the number of visitors and seasonal, per seasonal slash permanent population increase. As a result, the call volume will continue to increase. The province cost shares the delivery on a 50-50 basis. Any increase in service by the municipality is fully funded by the municipality in the first year. And we've already seen reports on the campus of care at Rockwood Terrace with the estimate to complete that campus of care and construct assisted living and seniors housing, which would be phase two of the redevelopment project with a cost of $48 million. Now I'm going to share my screen. And everyone can see my screen now? Not yet, Mary Lou. No, not? Okay. It's odd. It says it's showing. There we go. There you go. Okay. So Long-Term Care uh, Redevelopment Committee has seen this section of the presentation at their meeting. In order to construct two 128 bed homes, the county is estimating a cost of just shy of $108 million, less reserve contributions of $12.7 million and $5.6 million in redevelopment grants that would result in a borrowing requirement of almost $90 million. This is based on the information that we've recently received that Kim mentioned at $400,000 a bed, as well as an estimate of $5.5 million in site improvements for the Rockwood Terrace site. Both costings have been provided by consultants with expertise in their industry. The county will borrow with a 25 year term and the cost of borrowing will be offset by $1.5 million in annual construction subsidy from the province for the duration of the debenture. Yesterday's rate, um, a 25 year term with Infrastructure Ontario had an interest rate of 2.66%. Estimated annual debenture costs have been calculated based on using a 3% and a 4% borrowing rate and it's anticipated that a debenture payment would be made in 2025. I'll just walk through the calculations at the 3%, and then when I'm done that, I'll just show what the, the borrowing looks like at 4%. So we're building a total of 256 beds, 128 at each facility. Estimated cost of 400,000 per bed. Rockwood Terrace has a higher cost because we're looking at the 5.5, in redevelopment um, improvement costs. So the total estimated construction cost is $107,900,000. The difference between the two projects is that at Gray Gables, we are eligible for construction subsidy of 62 beds. The existing 66 are not eligible for redevelopment. Rockwood Terrace, as we know, requires redevelopment by, 100, um, by 2025. So therefore the full 128 beds that we've applied for are eligible. So this is a eligible funding of 190 beds. There is a difference in the per diem based on where you're located. So we are under a rural market amount, which is $20.78 per resident per day. There's also a medium home component, which is based on the home size of 75 cents. That gives us $21.53 per resident per day for a total of 69,350 resident days per year. We receive construction subsidy for 25 years. The annual construction subsidy for both builds is just under $1.5 million. And over the course of 25 years, the province will give us $37,327,000. Since we last looked at cost, the province had came out with a development grant and it's $29,246 per eligible bed, which gives us $5,556,740. The financing estimate for 256 bed built, a 
I've mentioned above, it's almost $108 million to build. We have been putting aside the money from Lee Manor's debenture. At the end of this year, it should approximate almost $8.6 million. I assume that we'll be making the 2022 to 2024 contributions of 1,361,000 as we've been doing in the past. That leaves a borrowing of $95,236,000. The redevelopment grant comes off that, which is the 5.5. So we're looking at borrowing almost $90 million. At 3% interest with a 25 year term, our borrowing for the two projects is 5,150,000. Annual construction subsidy comes off that, which is almost 1.5 million, which means our levy requirement is 3.6 million. We have 1.361 built into the budget already. So we would require a levy increase of $2.3 million. The development grant, I'll just speak a little bit to this. It provides the maximum of the 29,246 per eligible bed to the maximum of just under 5.6 million. Development grant is 12% of the estimated construction cost. In our scenario, construction costs will exceed the 12%. And it means that at least $242,100 per bed needs to be eligible expenditures in order to qualify for the full development grant. Ineligible expenditures are things like development charges, which uh, we don't have, architect fees, building permits, furniture equipment, not affixed to the building. So beds and portable lifts would be ineligible. Um, tubs and ceiling lifts would be eligible. And we haven't taken into account anything that we could possibly receive from development charges as the DC study is still in progress. If I flip to the same scenario using a 4% interest rate, our levy requirement is 4,247,000, less the existing contribution we're making of 1.361. So a levy increase of $2.9 million. The next piece of this is just talking about the additional debt that comes with multiple considerations. It has an impact on our sustainability, flexibility, and vulnerability, and our FRR risk ratings. With the county borrowing limits, um, last year in April, county approved a policy with a debt management repayment limit would not exceed 10% of our own source revenues. And that's considered a best practice. In 2021, using the infrastructure Ontario rate of 2.58% when this report was written, for a 25 year debenture, the county could borrow 140 million. If the rate was 4%, the maximum would be 120 million. So the, the, the Municipal Act does allow a municipality to have a debt repayment limit in excess of 25%. And the annual repayment limit that is uh, for 2021 is attached to this package. And it shows that our limit is $18.5 million. And when I've referenced that best practice recommends a limit of 10%, that provides some capacity for additional borrowing should emergencies occur, peak periods of asset management pressures, or to meet senior level of government funding opportunities. So when we're looking at the annual repayment limit, this first column is what is on the ARL that's attached. So this is our existing principal and interest. And it's this should be noted as external debt. So this is for um, the mortgage that's held on the Golden Town property, as well as um, our obligation for the commitment to Georgian College. If I add in the costs using the 4% interest rate, 
that becomes $6.4 million. Excluded debt, the FIR will exclude the $1.5 million that we would get in the annual construction subsidy. So our total debt charges would be just shy of $5 million. Our revenue would be almost 140 million. And the difference between this number and this number is the $1.5 million in construction subsidy. Excluded revenue. So the ARL looks at our own source revenue. Own source revenue includes such things as the rent we receive from housing tenants, uh, POA revenue, as well as long-term care residents, their amount of their co-payment. It excludes things like Ontario grants for tangible capital assets. So the difference between the two columns, again, is the construction subsidy and the other columns remain the same. So our net revenues would stay the same. 25% of net revenues stays the same. The annual repayment limit, you can see decreases by $4 million, just over four. Our debt management policy limit of 10% is $7.7 million. If I say $7.7 million, less our estimated debt charges of just under 5 million, we have 845,000 in internal debt that we would take off this. This is where we've borrowed for ourselves for the paramedic base at Chatsworth, the roof at Gray Gables, as well as the addition to this building. And then I'm also taking off $107,000, which is in the 10-year capital that we showed we were going to internally finance the construction of a paramedic base at Durham on the Rockwood Terrace site. So that would leave $1.8 million roughly left at the 10% policy limit. Thanks, Mary Lou. So just to uh, wrap this report up, Council, um, one note, at the 25% um, annual repayment limit, if you can stop sharing your screen, Mary Lou, the 25% repayment limit is part of the Municipal Act, and it's a threshold that um, municipalities are uh, to stay within. Um, if you get close to that or, or exceed the 25% uh, debt threshold, um, the province has the ability to put you into and into administration where they can come and, and try and help you manage your affairs a little bit more. So the purpose of this report was to ensure that council had all of the most current information before we took the next steps in the redevelopment process of hiring the architect and executing, executing development contracts with the province. Um, so there, I think there's, I hope we've given you some things to think about here. Um, at the redevelopment committee, I was asked to go back to the province and get some additional information from them about um, any alternatives that might be available to us. And um, the Ministry of Long-Term Care responded that while they would um, entertain conversations about um, extending the project timeline for the Grey Gables project, if we wanted to push that out into the future, since again, it's not in the same um, uh, licensing situation that uh, Rockwood Terrace is, uh, but they would not be uh, amenable to a conversation about an addition. Um, I think having putting, my understanding from speaking with our project manager is that an addition would introduce um, uh, two areas in the home, one that was prior to the 2015 design guidelines and, and then another one that was um, here in, at, the, at the present time. And so they only would accept a, a new 128 bed build um, at the Markdale site. That is another issue as well as, um, you know, the, the, the timing of all of this and COVID, right? When we planned this, we didn't know that, that COVID was coming and we know that there's an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes 
um, to help long-term care facilities be in better shape for the future. So what, you know, the extent to which there may be future design guideline changes is, is something that we don't know about just yet. And we're really relying on, on Collier's to be on top of that aspect of things, as well as any architect that we hire in the future. Um, so I'll leave it there. And certainly Mary Lou and I are very open to any questions that we can answer for you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tim and Mary Lou for that presentation. Uh, Councillor Milne, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, the question uh, is of course directed to Mary Lou. I note uh, at the very, or thank you very much for walking us through that. That, that, was, that was excellent. Uh, my question is related to the uh, bottom of the uh, columns, I guess, that you were going through on page 50 of our agenda. And it shows levy incre increase required uh, for Gray Gables is 2.3 million and yet Rockwood is zero. Um, can you just uh, explain uh, quickly why the two are that far apart? Like why is there no levy requirement for the Rockwood build? Yet there's 2.3 for Gray Gables, please. Very good question, thank you. We have been setting away the 1,361,000 that was originally the Lee Manor debenture for the purpose of redeveloping Rockwood because we knew that it needed to be redeveloped by 2025. So what I've done is I'm applying the full amount to the Rockwood Terrace build, which is why there's no levy re requirement. And the remainder of what was available, which was just under 53,000, became available for Greg Abels, which brought it in at a levy increase of $2.3 million. And then when you move to the 4% scenario, at 4% interest, the 1,361,000 is not sufficient for Rockwood Terrace. It requires $212,344 levy increase. And then it would require the full amount for Greg Abels, which is the Two million six hundred seventy-one seventy-four thousand one hundred nineteen dollars. Go ahead. Yeah, you're muted, uh, Councilor Mill. Sorry. So, uh, just to summarize, <clears throat> if I understand correctly, if we were to build both projects, there'd be a requirement of the levy of $2.3 million, which translates into a 3.7% increase in the levy. If we were to only do the Rockwood project and leave Gray Gables a 66 bed facility to carry on as it is now, there would be no impact to the levy. Is that correct? At a 3% interest rate. Right. At the 4% interest rate, Rockwood Terrace would still need $212,344, yes, an increase right. to the levy. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Mill. Next is Deputy Warden McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and <clears throat> thank you for bringing that report forward, uh, following up from our uh, committee meeting of last week. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Uh, to you, Mary Lou, with regards to, you made a comment yesterday, the infrastructure money was 2.7, I forget, I just, 6, 7, I can't just remember what your, what your comment was and, and how many, and that's for what year of, how long, of, is that 10 year money or what was that rate that you had mentioned there just a few minutes ago? Yeah, 25 year borrow at 2.66. And when I wrote the report last week, it was, uh, or when we finalized the report last week, rather, it was 2.58. Right. Well, I didn't, I didn't know you could, you could borrow 25 year money, uh, which, you know, to think you get 25 year money at that kind of rate is pretty remarkable. I know we just did a debenture just recently at the municipality Green Highlands for 10 year money, and it was just over a little over 1% for 10 year money. So, uh, I don't think we, it's, it's unprecedented to see that kind of long-term money available at this time. Um, I know quite a few of us probably around the table in our viewing public <laughs> have seen a quite a, a, a variance in regards to um, interest rates. Um, just in the sense of the, um, I think maybe following up a little bit on Councillor Millen's comments about 
the 66 bed facility that is the Gray Gables. And I know that we are moving forward with the behavioral um, 20 beds of that in Gray Gables as well. So no doubt moving forward with uh, a rebuild of Gray Gables, would there be, would there be a, a little change and an extra cost on that rebuild because of those 20 bed behavioral units that's uh, sort of, um, that's sort of uh, being incorporated into the 128 bed new facility? As I can respond to that, if you will, Mr. Warden. Um, our discussions with the province, and this, first of all, the, the BSTU um, is, a, is a proof of concept. So this is a time limited project right now. And the uh, agreement that we have with the province is that our costs, Gray County's costs, um, were to be covered. Um, and so we've done our very best to identify what those costs would be and work with the province to ensure that the uh, project money that they're providing to us is sufficient to cover that off. But at this stage, there's been um, no decision made as to what the future of a BSTU might be. Um, again, this was the province uh, taking a look at this and, and to determine its viability. So just to follow up with that, Mr. Warden, so uh, is it fair to say that this is the two-year project that's looking at the current facility, but we have no indication moving forward with the rebuild that that would be included in the new new facility? And I guess the question is, if it was, would there be funding that would offset those extra 20 beds from the province if they are um, supporting that concept? through uh, funding from the province? As a, we, haven't, we haven't undertaken any negotiations with the province um, with regard to having a BSTU in the, in the new belt. So I, I can't really answer that. The beds are, the beds I would assume, the beds would be funded as they are. Um, the same with the, the funding that's available to our, our regular our regular beds. The difference with the BSTU is that there's some additional staffing support right. that comes along with that. Okay, just to follow up with that, because I think that's an interesting um, perspective in the sense that if the two-year trial was to be considered and considered in the new build uh, moving forward, we would need to know that at a certain junction in order to design that part probably into that uh, that new build but I think that is something that that was included of the 128 uh, facility for Greg Gables that 20 bed is a unique situation that we know that is very much in demand as we see a lot of our homes whether they're public or private in the sense of that um, that uh, demand on just the the uh, society it's itself uh, the other part is um, we're not mentioning, and I raised this last week with regards to then the current facility of Gray Gables, which as we know, is only 20 years old or a little over 20 years old of a facility. And uh, I understand from previous reports that if you took that 66 uh, uh, bed facility and converted it to assisted living, I think at one time there was some number of a 40, a 40 bed facility would come out of that. And if that was the case, I guess this is high level in the sense that I understand that for assisted living with the quality or the, I understand the, the desire for Greg Gables even currently as a long-term care facility is much sought after as if there were, you know, I hear, I hear numbers now on assisted living around the $4,000 mark. So 4,000 times 40 is 1.9 million a year. And if half that was your cost, there could be, you know, easily, uh, and this is, just a, an estimate of maybe a one million dollar year revenue stream that could come out of that um, out of that uh, opportunity is creating that into an assisted living. And we know that the, as we talked last week with regards to our um, discussion at our meeting about the province is moving forward to that community hub or health hub um, idea. And as you know, it's it is located. Uh, uh, in a stone's throw from the, the new hospital that's in the process of being uh, constructed along with the CHC as, uh, as we are also aware of in Markdale. Also from the uh, 
presentation that was presented for the rock t rock um, uh, wood rebuild there was there was one part of that report talked about the current rockwood building and a cost of um I think a half a million dollars to for the demolition part, but I think those are there's a lot of decisions there. Whether as county council are moving that way, whether we would take on a half a million dollar cost to tear it down, or maybe sell it for a half a million dollars and let somebody create assist living in there. And I only raise that there's there's a, this is very high level to a lot of decisions to be made moving forward. Just in the sense of the comment about the ten percent borrowing, uh, certainly I think we are all very respectful of the part of borrowing in the sense of, but 10% uh, is probably a very good conservative level to be within that. But I don't think there's anything saying with regards to other, under unique circumstances that we could cross that threshold of 10%, just in the sense of that, going back to that point I was raising earlier on that uh, we're in our, in our history, have we, have we ever seen 2.66% on 25 year money, which part of the reason I raise that is, is sometimes there's opportunities for investing. And I, and I think as was mentioned at our committee meeting last week, that the whole part of moving forward with regards to long-term care generally in Gray County is, is investing in long-term care and, and the seniors that, that are, that are, or those doesn't necessarily have to be a senior in the sense of, of the of the part of long-term care. We've seen younger individuals with the need of long-term care as well. So we know there's a huge demand and wait list for those uh, services. And so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll sort of wrap it up that, you know, this was something that I think it's good to see this report. It's very, it's very respectful and very important that we as county councillors and uh, you know, the decision makers understand moving forward. And, um, but I feel that that's, we're at that juncture in our history that the investment is needed. And it's at a time where the opportunities for borrowing is sort of lining for that part. And uh, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Ward. Thank you very much. Councilor Sowever, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And, um... I want to thank uh, staff for this report. Um, I do, however, have a, a couple of concerns um, in, in with regards, and, and Mayor McQueen brought it up, the existing 62-bed uh, building um, at um, Gray Gables, and you know, you know, we we we've all heard the bleak assessments on the um, you know Gray Gables and the economics of Gray Gables for you know, for the entire term of this council. Um, and certainly, um, you know, we, we've also heard from the public in, in the last election that, you know, they wanted Gray Gables to be kept open. And, you know, we always get a very bleak assessment, but I would like to know where the value is shown in this. The It says estimated construction costs 400,000 per bed for 128 beds, but where is the value of the existing 62 bed unit. Um, certainly it has some cash value, which could be taken off the 51 uh, million two. Uh, as Mayor McQueen pointed out, um, and most uh, long-term care providers recognize now there's that long care care, as this report shows, is not a money-making business. So what they move to is a campus of care where they charge markets rates for senior apartments um, adjacent to a long-term care home so people can access some of those services provided at the long-term care home while living in their own seniors' apartments. So there are seniors living uh, accommodations like in Collingwood, Chartwell charges 4,000 to 5,000 a month. And that's, you know, Certainly, you know, I don't think we can we can do that in Markdale, but even even half of that would go a long way towards subsidizing um, the 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 long term care build and operating of the Great Gable. So I just like to know. Um, that's my first question: is how do we factor in the value of that existing asset into this uh, presentation? Through you, Mr. Warden, um, at this time. Uh, your council will recall that we retained um, SHS and Salter Pilon to undertake feasibility. 
studies of the highest and best use of um, Gray Gables. We're still waiting for the final report from the consultants in that regard. Um, so we don't know the extent to which um, renovation would be required for Gray Gables or what that renovation would cost. Um, at the present time, the county puts in in excess of $7 million a year to support the operation of the existing long-term care beds that we have. And so should there be a surplus, um, perhaps that surplus would be applied to um, the levy requirements of, uh, of the existing operations. Certainly the co consultants, when they did the pro forma for the seniors housing and assisted living for Rockwood Terrace, took a look at where the market was and uh, what we could expect uh, to um, obtain for uh, rental rates. I don't think the, the numbers probably, I don't expect them to be wildly different um, one for another. Um, so we could certainly go back and look at that. But as far as uh, a value of the existing building, I think where as staff, what we were looking at was wanting to know what the cost of additional renovations would be and how the revenue that um, future occupants might pay might be used to offset the cost of that uh, capital investment to turn it over. So we may be a number of years in the future before we would really be in, in a situation of seeing those, those rents as um, like net new revenue. Um, uh, Councillor McQueen also spoke about um, Rockwood Terrace. Well, we did have um, the current consultants look at Rockwood Terrace. And again, this is, I think, maybe the second or third time we've had confirmation that the way that the Rockwood Terrace building is constructed does not lend itself to renovation for uh, seniors housing apartments. It's the way the building is actually constructed would make it prohibitively expensive to try and, uh, and do that. And the footprint that the current Rockwood Terrace occupies is meant to be repurposed for the new seniors housing and assisted living. So it would come down so that you had the site to then to build the second phase. So I hope that answers your question, Councillor Soever. Oh, through the warden, um, I, I guess in the, the long and short of it, from that lengthy answer is that there was no value attributed in this uh, financial projection to the existing 60, 62 bed unit. Uh, can you help me understand what value it is that you would be looking to see? I, I'm confused because this is meant the the numbers that Mary Lou provided are specific to the construction of a new 128 bed build, which is the only thing that the province, that's what our application was put forward to the province to do. And, and they've confirmed that they wouldn't be willing to look at an addition to the existing Grey Gables. So we don't really have that opportunity at this time. Well, they're on the Grey Gables site, there's a 62 bed unit, which would be re partially replaced by the 128 beds. So no, it would be a brand new 128 bed well, build exactly. ad adjacent to the existing 62 bed facility. Yeah, so then the 62 bed facility would become a uh, surplus. So even if it wasn't developed for a county operation as a long-term care bed, there's real estate underneath that. There's uh, a building there that somebody else may want to buy and operate. So the value is not zero. It's something, and certainly it's more than uh, two cents. So, you know, when we cal calculate the, I guess what we could do is uh, under site improvement costs, uh, we're going to get revenue by selling that building. I mean, that's. Part of it, the reason it becomes surplus is because of the new build. So what we're getting here is the most negative where it has zero value, when in fact there is value that is generated by that 128 bed build, which is the fact that the 62 bed building and the real estate underneath it becomes surplus. 
I think we would need to go back to our consultants uh, to confirm whether or not that was the case, Councillor Soever. The uh, Markdale site is very tight between um, Grey Gables, the room that would be required for the, um, the new build, and the property that the hospital is required to have. Um, as it is um, with the new build, I think we would be looking to um, speak with the hospital about um, bringing some, some property back to Gray County. Um, the new build is essentially attached to the existing building because that's how much room, that there's not extra room to set it off to one side. Um, it, would be, it would be an interesting discussion, I think, to determine whether or not um, this would be a, a, a saleable property if the two things are, are actually joined together. So, but we could certainly look into that. Thank you. Um, Just point, of, point of order, Mr. Warden, it's 66 yeah. bed. I'm, I'm sorry, please repeat. The current facility is 66 bed, not 62. Right. Okay. Moving um, along. Uh, one more, Mr. Warden. Yes. Um, fundamental to the financial analysis is the $400,000 for bed cost, but there's not a lot of detail on how that's arrived. Um, I couldn't help but notice that um, the in the Owen Sound Sun Times, um, it talked about the Southbridge build of 160 beds having a construction value of 20 million, which works out to 125,000 per bed. Now, certainly, construction build is not the entire cost, but there's a large gap between 125,000 and 400,000. And I'm sure Owen Sound is sharp enough that they didn't get taken to the cleaners on the construction value of that building. And so, uh, you know, I'm just having a hard time uh, figuring out, and, and perhaps because it is so fundamental to this financial analysis, um, is it possible to see how that 40% increase from 280,000 to 400,000 was derived? Because certainly um, I haven't had time to research uh, other builds, but I'm working on it um, and calling some people I know in the long-term care industry. But certainly um, it seems like a, um, a, a large increase. I know construction costs are up, but um, you know, to have Southbridge at 125, even if you double that, you get back to near the original 280, but then, you know, they add another 40% to it. I'm just wondering how the private sector comes in uh, so much lower than the public. Okay, so it's not a point of order, but it is a legitimate question. Um, yes. Kim? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, this is the information that we were provided by Colliers. I can tell you when we started to do the original summary report to go back to the redevelopment committee, we were still using the $280,000 a bed. And Colliers, who's actively involved in a number of projects, came back to us and said, you, our best advice is that you need to adjust those numbers to be more realistic and reflective of what we're seeing on the ground today. So I think um, certainly uh, we could have a further discussion um, at this council or at redevelopment with Colliers, um, but those are the numbers that they provided to us based on the experience that they're having right now. The other thing is that these this is construction that is expected to begin in 2023, right? So we are, we're looking two years into the future and, and trying to uh, determine um, where costs are likely to be by the time we get to that point. Um, you know, the question about interest rates again, and I spoke to the Bank of Canada's um, having concerns with rising interest rates, the Fed in the US says that they expect that interest rates will be three and a half percent in 2022 and 3.8% in 2023. So 
there are things happening that are very much outside of our control. And as staff, we just wanted to bring this information, the most current information forward to you. This is the best information we've been able to pull together. Is it exhaustive? No, but if there are other questions that you'd like us to investigate further or other information, or you wanna hear directly from Colliers, by all means, we can, we can make those arrangements for you. But this was meant to be for your benefit. Yes, um, I think I'd like to see the, you know, the basis of the 400,000 because it's such a fundamental number. Everything else in the report gets driven by the 400,000. Even if it moves, you know, $20,000, it makes a huge difference. Um, so, you know, I think because it is fundamental to the entire analysis, it'd be great to see the basis of those numbers. Just saying that this is kind of, what industry is seeing, then they must have the information of examples of builds and that, you know, we could see so we could have confidence that, the, you know, the underlying assumptions are correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We're moving on to Councillor O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, County Council. Uh, when I first saw this $108 million, I was, I was more than shocked. By the time I got to the committee meeting, I was overflowing in sarcasm. Today, I'm gonna to lean as hard as I can on plain old common sense. Um, I had a question for, uh, two questions for Kim, if I could. Uh, the first one was, I, I was gonna ask her to give me a list of the things that we won't be able to go ahead with if we spend this $108 million, but I think Mary Lou looked after that. My second question, I went back and watched that meeting on January 24th, 2019. And I find it interesting, especially with what Councillor Soever just said, um, both him and Councillor Desai on that meeting said, it's not about dollars and cents. And that's what happens when you make a decision without looking at the financial comp uh, implications first. Um, you know, we, we end up with this situation. So, in that meeting, Councillor McQueen was talking about the previous council that was looking at 2011 data. So now we're two and a half years past that meeting in 2019. So I just wanted to ask him, what's changed in the data in that two and a half years? I know the funding model is not the same. Um, as far as the, the, the costs of, of redevelopment, is that, is that your question, Councillor O'Leary? What's, what's changed about the redevelopment yeah. costs? Yeah, um, I think a number of, of things are, are, have, they started to evolve before COVID. And, and I think that um, the pandemic has really um, maybe accelerated changes that we might've expected anyway. Infection prevention and control um, in, the, in the homes is really, really paramount. That means that we have to use space differently. We have to configure it differently. We have to plan for it differently. We need to be able to provide isolation space um, for people and be able to isolate um, areas of the home effectively. Um, we need to plan for people um, to be able to um, have visitors depending on you know where they are there's a whole lot of challenges and requirements to to the, the space that need to be built into this as well as um, the the ventilation systems and 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 all of that um, there's so much like we've talked about it at at the committee of management and again at redevelopment and at this table our number one concern is staffing and we need to make sure that um, whatever we build is the best possible environment, both for the staff as, as well as the residents themselves so that we can continue to operate um, appropriately. Um, we, like, in order to attract and retain staff right now, we're having to really look at the whole model, the whole compensation model, um, making further investments to people. So the, the operations aspect of long-term care has only become more complex 
and, and more expensive. And as much as the province, I think, is committed to working with us, it takes time. And the county and all of our colleagues who are also running long-term care are having to put in a lot of extra investment uh, to keep um, things in, in um, good, solid administrative footing. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, Mr. Warden, I, I have some things written down here and I, I, I'm going to go through them and I have to get some clarification from Mary Lou afterwards because I've heard different numbers than what I'm getting. I thought I took this off the report. The levy increase required is 2,886,462, which is a 4.7% increase in, in the levy. This would impact the rates at which the county could borrow money in the future debt repayment would require levy increases, service reductions, and budget cuts in other areas of the county operation. So let's put these things, let, let's put this in perspective. We'll talk about affordable housing. And I apologize for repeating some of what um, has already been said. To, the, uh, to address the wait list for affordable housing, and an estimated 600 plus new affordable housing units would be required at a current cost of $300,000 per unit. It's $180 million if we wanted to fix our affordable housing crisis right now today. We've committed one full percentage from the budget to affordable housing because we have an affordable housing crisis. That's $610,500 a year towards this crisis. And we're gonna sit here and discuss a 4.7% increase in the levy for long-term care. It's not a crisis. Is that the way our priorities are? 1% of the levy to a crisis, 4.7% to a non-crisis. We also have an op opioid crisis that we have yet to tackle. So let this sink in. By the time this long-term care project comes to fruition in 2025, 80 to another 100 more people will die from overdose, from an opioid overdose that we have done nothing about. So I think this comes down to pretty simple decision. Are we gonna admit that we made a mistake on January 24th, 2019 and going ahead with two projects without looking at the financial impl implication? Or are we gonna spend $108 million and cripple and handcuff the next six councils because that's what it's going to do? When I watched that video on January 24th, it was Councillor McQueen's motion and the, he got the last word. And the last thing he said was, this is about our future. And you know what? He's right. This is about our future. And we can't afford to spend $108 million. There's nothing wrong with Gray Gables. It's an A-plus facility. We have to replace Rockwood. That's where our focus should be. That's what we can afford. And that's what we should be doing. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. <clears throat> Next is Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning, County Council. And uh, thanks very much, Mary Lou, for the uh, the numbers and Kim for reaching out to the uh, the ministry. Uh, I can tell you that I am pleased uh, with their response that they would like to see uh, a brand new build. Uh, I believe based on the information that we received through Colliers that uh, to rebuild the two homes sim simultaneously, there is cost savings to be had by doing that. Uh, I recognize that there's some uh, staggering numbers today, but it has been a decision of this council that uh, long-term care was a priority. Um, you know, when you break this down, you know, it's put it into perspective. Uh, my belief is that this is less than a cup of coffee per week per household. So it's not a huge dollar when you break it down per household. So let's not lose sight of that. Let's not lose sight. You know, Councillor Lee or Leary mentioned about there's a crisis in uh, affordable housing. He is absolutely right. 
But I would say that there's a crisis in long-term care also because there's approximately four or 500 people on a waiting list. And if you're one of those individuals or those family members that are trying to deal with someone that's waiting for long-term care, that's a crisis. So, you know, our, our population is aging all the time. You know, every report we see is Gray County's population continues to age. We're going to need these beds. We need them now. We're going to need them in the future. The uh, province has given us an opportunity by granting Gray County additional beds. And that's the way I see it. And I don't think we want to lose that opportunity. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. And next is Councillor Desai. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks. Um, I was mentioned by name with regards to an earlier meeting. So I'll respond to that. I do still stand by the fact that it shouldn't be, that we shouldn't uh, solely consider money as the issue. Um, there was enough people that wanted to see um, the, the long-term care issue tackled that it changed the, uh, the, the makeup of county council in the 2018 elections. So I'll, I'll say that to start with. Um, I can appreciate Councillor O'Leary's comment. I can appreciate him trying to put me on the spot and that's fine. Uh, but at the same time, the next time I hear someone say, well, you know, the county isn't doing that, I'll say, well, yeah, the county is doing long term care, which is what a lot of people spoke up and said they wanted. So we did it. It's cost us this much. And because of that, we can't do a bridge. We can't do a road. We can't do this, that or the other thing uh, to say that long term care is, is, is uh, not a crisis is, quite frankly, uh, misleading uh, as per a um, May 26, 2021. Uh, article in iPolitics. Um, we do have a shortage of long-term care beds and uh, it's definitely in the five figures that the shortage is. Um, uh, it's also interesting to hear Councillor uh, Councillor O'Leary bring up the opioid crisis now. I do not recall him bringing that up in the past. So um, I'll, I'll give him this, I'll give him an olive branch, uh, Warden Hicks. Uh, if he tells me right now that he has enough support to put 4.7%, towards these um, uh, issues that he's calling crisis issues, I'll accept the, his premise that maybe we did make a mistake in that meeting on, on the 20th of uh, January, I believe he said. But if he's not going to put 4.7% uh, to, to these uh, issues, then maybe he should accept that he's using them as a, uh, as a token. And I, I, can't, I can't appreciate that. Um, at the end of the day, um, there was enough people that asked for it. There was enough people um, that, that, that wanted it bad enough, regardless of the cost that it changed, as I said earlier, the makeup of county council. And so we're, we're going with that. And if there are things that we cannot afford to do in, in the future, um, and I'll, I'll use my uh, youth card, it'll likely be my generation that uh, ends up with that, um, with that, having to foot that bill. Um, well, we have to take the stance that we did what we were um, asked to do uh, by a majority of the public. So, uh, yeah, I still stand by what I said, Councillor Councillor O'Leary. If that's what you're trying to get me to change. Okay, thank you, Councillor Desai. Next is Councillor Body. Thank you uh, very much, Warden Hicks. Um, I, I, I think my history is obvious. Uh, last council, I supported trying to put the two buildings together because one, Gray Gables is already or will be by the time we get there 25 years old and it would have been really nice to have state of the art with uh, everybody in one building. The efficiencies of building two buildings together would never uh, have been as good as uh, uh, building one building in one location. Yeah, the kids might have had to have dri driven further but it would have been uh, more financially uh, responsible and I think would have really provided better service for those uh, current 66 beds at Gray Gables. Uh, having said that, this council decided to overturn that decision and move forward. I can live with that. Um, once a decision is made by council, it's a, it's a decision that we all should support. I blame nobody but myself, frankly, because I think back in January, I spoke in favor of uh, trying to add beds to uh, Gray Gables. My thinking at the time was that financially it is more efficient to run 128 beds than it is to run 66 beds. 
However, that efficiency that we, we would pick up in the operation, uh, I don't think overcomes the cost now of adding those uh, approximately 62 new beds. It would take us forever to, and I don't know the exact number of years, I didn't calculate it. It would take us a long time to overcome the building cost, adding up the efficiencies by adding the beds, I hope I'm making sense, um, to overcome those costs. So I, I don't think we made a mistake, frankly, I don't think I made a mistake in voting in favor of adding these beds back in whenever it was in January. I think we needed the information and uh, wouldn't have got that information if we hadn't moved forward uh, that we're getting today. So now we're getting these numbers and uh, we can nickel and dime them a little bit and maybe the uh, going to 400,000 per bed from 280 isn't quite right. Maybe it's only 380 uh, or, or, or something like that per bed. It is still a heck of a lot of money and we're still three years out from building and with all the uh, the financial people that have given us this report are trying to estimate what we're going to be like in two years, but um, I, I, you know, we still don't know. It could be more. We've just been through, or maybe we're still in the middle of a uh, COVID crisis where the uh, province and federal government have thrown a ton of money at it, which means big debts, which means that at some point they're going to have to pay off those debts and they're not going to be handing out money like they have the last couple of years. Uh, we know we've got inflation coming, so we're not going to be maintaining the interest rate uh, that we're getting right now. I don't think uh, forever, but maybe, maybe we will. Um, getting this report today changes my mind or changes my vote of what I would have, what I thought on uh, January of uh, 2019, if that is the date. I don't think we can continue to afford to uh, do this if we want to do other things. And it's not so much as a uh, is uh, Councillor Desai has suggested, are we going to spend that 4.7 and something else? I think it's uh, more the ability to not be able to spend anything on some of those other uh, crises going forward if we move forward uh, with this. You know, What are we going to have to give up to do this for a total of 62 beds? Um, I think we're in tough. I think it's a tough decision for all of us to recognize that, but I, I I don't see how I support it going forward uh, when there's when it handcuffs the county for us and for future uh, councils going forward to try and figure out how we're going to spend uh, spend. Excuse me. With regard to only a cup of coffee uh, per household, it might be only a cup of coffee per household, but unfortunately, it's going to mean that we're not going to be able to afford the donut or the sandwich or or uh, you know maybe something else going forward. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bigger picture than just a cup of coffee per household, unfortunately. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boddy, uh, Councillor McQueen, and then Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And, and um, I want to keep this conversation to a very high level of the great county council that we do have here today. Uh, certainly, I'll take uh, Mr. O'Leary's words that... Uh, those are the words I would say back then it was about the future. And yeah, it is about the future. And I would say that we made a decision at that time, which we heard, I felt at the time, very loud and clear, which all the years of sitting on county council and my years of being in politics, uh, long-term care was, was a very concerning issue to the public of Gray County. It, it, I've never seen such a an item that had so much discussion. And I think we probably all would agree with that. And, you know, we have um, been, a, I think, a progressive county council with regards to looking at long-term care, but also we do, we did look at, we are looking at affordable housing and we are looking at uh, climate change and we are looking at those other items as well. So I think, you know, uh, it's, I think we, as a county council have, you know, looked at those points that, uh, Councillor O'Leary has pointed out, and I think, uh, you know, we do have some other reports coming to County Council as well, but it's, you know, it's tough. It's tough decisions that we have to make, and, and we have to make those decisions on the best information that we have at the time of those decisions are made. Uh, the other part I want to raise here, a couple other parts, is is just the back on the part of the current Grey Gables. I think there is value there that we're just not sure what that is at this point. So I think we have to sort of park that, that 
if we're, I mean, originally when we started here and I, you know, I'll, I'll candidly say myself that it was about adding a wing to Grey Gables, not necessarily a brand new building, but as we see from the province and uh, our Madam CEO has reported back with us today that the preferable uh, option is, is looking at a brand new building. And you got to remember that when that gets to that point, it's, it's, it sort of resets that 25 year old building into a brand new space for long-term care moving forward. And there is the efficiencies of 66 to 128. So we'll park that part of what that value is for now, but we're, we're missing the part here of what about the future growth of Gray County? We see, I know just personally ourselves in Gray, Gray Highlands here, you know, it's been 25 years since we've seen a subdivision start happening in, in, um, in Markdale. And we're looking at projections now of anywhere between 1,000 and 15 homes over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's just Gray, Gray Highlands. I know Own Sounds is seeing growth. I know Meaford is seeing growth. We've continued to see the growth that's happening in the town of the mountains, Southgate, uh, West Gray, uh, Durham, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I can't speak. I know Hanover. I, I know the warden has spoke about the demands and the, and the mayor is, herself has spoke about. Uh, and we had that tour last year. Um, I know myself and seeing the growth in Hanover and that's it's great. It's so, you know, we're, t- we're sort of at that pause. But it's sort of like, you know, buying a house or buying a farm or buying something at the present day. And then you're you're 10 15, 20 years out, you look back and go, wow, you know, I, I, I'm glad I made that purchase. I'm glad I made that decision because look at what it's costing now. And, you know, you, we have to put things in perspective up now into that future. And so, you know, I, I know that, you know, this is a, uh, a point of, and I think it's really good that this information is here today, but I think we have to put things in perspective in the sense of the big picture. And I know that, it's, uh, you know, what's the future growth? And we're hearing that growth. And, you know, that growth is new revenue for Gray County. And uh, so I think we have to put that in perspective as we're looking at today's level and, and assessment. But we, we know that, that there's a future um, uh, assessment from that growth that we're seeing. And, and, uh, and also, I think that uh, going through in the new DC charge, aspect certainly we need to look at that part as well and and look at uh you know is there opportunities through that new dc charge to to sort of look at long-term care in a sense of uh of uh of support of some sort so thank you mr warden for those ability to for those comments thank you sir and councillor robinson you're next thank you mr warden um i certainly am proud of uh gray county and staff for the forward thinking initiatives and programs that uh, that certainly we've done within this term of council. And I often go back to the um, cornerstone document of our corporate strategic plan and also the most recent uh, report that was presented to this council, which um, enhanced or reconfirmed our priorities for, for this council. Certainly long-term care is within, uh, ingrained within our strategic plan. It's ingrained within the strategic pillars or priorities for this term of council. And I'm referencing goal number two, support healthy and connected communities, where very apparent within the strategic initiatives, we see long-term care plan that meets the present and future needs of the people who live in our communities, our community of Gray County. I want this council, please, to remain focused on what is important to our Gray County community at this time. And we've heard loud and clear that long-term care is that priority. Also within goal number one, the, um, to grow the uh, Gray County economy, again, speaks to uh, improved prosperity and quality of life of our community. So certainly I support long-term care and our, our journey and our uh, direction that we're taking within um, our strategic direction that we're taking within our county at this time. And I also will support the recommendation at hand that has been presented within this report. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you. And Councillor Potter, you're next. Uh, thank you. And the, the theme that I keep hearing is the question, 
which is, is this really going to do what we need it to do? Uh, as Councillor Robinson just said, that we long-term care is a priority, but how far is this going to go in, in resolving some of the issues we have? It'll go some way, but it won't, uh, it certainly will not fill all the gaps in long-term care, nor will it address some of the issues that Councillor O'Leary raised earlier. So uh, it is nice to say that, yes, we, we, uh, we need to look after some of the issues that have been raised, but we have a lot more than one issue. So I think that uh, the, the question really is, how far does this go to resolving the problem that we're trying to solve? And for the cost, uh, what I'm hearing around the table is a lot of concern that the cost is not taking us where we need to go uh, on this issue. Okay, thank you, Councillor Potter. I see Councillor Burley with his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I'm probably the youngest one on County Council and I've been around for a long time listening to the long-term care, social services and everything for years and years and years. Uh, I think in uh, this term of council, we put tremendous pressure on our staff uh, trying to get reports to us and get us ready information. They've, they've done an excellent job. Uh, yes, uh, we do need to build Rockwood we have a plan in place and it's moved forward very good. Rockwood or uh, Great Gables, yes, it, it is important, but I agree 100% with Councillor Leary's comments, the way he presented it very nicely. It, it, it was exactly the way I was thinking. I made a comment at our committee meeting, which I'm gonna repeat it again today. It made sense to me and I hope it makes sense to everyone else. I drive a Jeep. I always wanted a Rolls Royce. I can't afford a rules for it right now. Someday I will, but I plan accordingly. And uh, the same with the Great Gables rebuild. If it's, we're not under great pressure to proceed with that right now, we can do our planning that we have going forward. Yes, I think we're taking the right steps. We, we waited for this report, which we finally got here recently on actual cost. I'd like to have that two years ago would have made our job easier, but we have it now. And uh, as everything in this world we live in proceeds very, very slowly. And I, I just uh, agree 100% that uh, we need to be thinking about what we're doing for future councils. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I don't see any other hands, Madam Clerk. So if that's the case, uh, oh, Councillor Desai. Yeah, sorry, um, just a quick question uh, with, with regards to what the, uh, what the CAO said earlier. Um, I just wanted to confirm my understanding that in her conversations with the ministry, the ministry was um, it's amenable to saying, well, we can hold the beds for you um, while you complete Rockwood Terraces, but they wouldn't fund uh, or they wouldn't help us fund a brand new build. Is that correct? So they, they would basically, they would allow us to pause the uh, Gray Gables uh, process for the time being while still holding the beds for us. And so through, you, Mr. through you, Mr. Warden, yes, the, the province told me that they were open to a conversation about extending um, a timeline for Gray Gables, that it wouldn't um, wouldn't need to be, uh, that project wouldn't need to be completed by 2025. We could look at completing that project at some point in the future. Okay. Um, having said that, um, as much as I tried, my fiscal, fiscally responsible side does come back to haunt me every so often. Um, can I request clarity on the, on the um, recommendation right now that if we if it is received for information without any further detail, um, that doesn't allow staff to put a pause on the Gray Gables process, correct? That would be that would have to be an amendment or a separate motion. Our CAL has got her hand up. Oh, sorry, our the, clerk. The, the clerk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. So. Um, 
You are correct. This, this report is to be received for information um, because council has made its decision. If um, it's council's wish to look to a different direction, it would be my recommendation that that come through a notice of motion. Well, now, and, and if I could argue the process on this, um, and I, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume that I could win win a battle of uh, or a debate of, of procedure with with the honorable uh, clerk. Would it would it not be appropriate to to allow the motion to come forward now, given that we are already discussing um, the long term care uh, project and we are discussing the financials around it, and so in a way, we are perhaps discussing what the path forward should be. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Warden, um, I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think this information here is for financial considerations. And if council is looking to go for a different direction on, for example, Gray Gables, um, I think that needs to come through a separate motion. And I think it needs to come through a notice of motion. Very well, I will, I will, uh, I will concede that point and I will, uh, I, I won't take up any more time given that we are a little short on it today. Um, I will I will bring a notice of motion forward at the end of uh, this meeting then. Thank you, uh, first, uh, Morrison. Thank you, Councillor Desai. I see Councillors uh, Mackey and Soever with their hands up. Uh, I am gonna remind you at the beginning, I said we need to move things along. We've had a very good discussion on this. Mind you, this is a very important issue and we should have good robust discussion, but I would just remind you that we have a very heavy agenda and need to move along. So Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And, and just uh, very quickly following up on what uh, Councillor Desai mentioned in Kim's response, uh, I just wanna remind that if there is going to be another notice of motion coming forward in regards to uh, delaying uh, the build of Gray Gables, that there will be added expenses. If it's still council's intent to go ahead with the rebuild, the uh, Colliers is saying that there's synergies to do the two builds together. So I just want uh, you know council to be be clear on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mackey. Councilor Soever, you're muted, sir. You're still muted. There, I keep missing there you go. the button. Um, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I'd like to move an amendment to the motion that council asked staff to have an independent peer review completed of the financial assumptions in this report, including incorporating a value for the existing 66 bed um, building at Gray Gables. Uh, Madam Clerk, I seek your advice on that. Can that work as it an is, amendment? Or? I would say that is germane to this, this motion. It is um, specifically speaking to the numbers contained within the uh, original report. And um, so if, if there's an amendment on specifically the numbers, in my opinion, that's germane to the uh, report on the floor right now. Very good then. So can we work a little bit on the language? Why don't we do this? Um, I, I feel like we need to take a little break. I know that we're nearing the end of this discussion. Um, I, I just want to poll people. Uh, is anyone wanting to take a break and come back to this amendment or would you prefer to push along, complete this uh, item and then take a break? So uh, taking a break now, give me now. Point of order, please, yes. Mr. Uh, Warden. Yes. Yes. We are, we're in a, um, we have a motion on the floor. So I would respectfully disagree with you. I think we need to uh, not take a break. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I think you're right. So with that said, can we work on the language around the amendment that's being uh, proposed? Madam CAO? By all means, we can work on the, uh, the language <laughs> um, and I'll try and help the clerk with that. I am still, somewhat confused as to the the nature of this valuation for Gray Gables and how you see that um, fitting into the pro forma for construction. So perhaps counselors, so ever we can take that offline. I will be going back to Colliers and um, 
and speaking to them about um, providing some additional information at your direction. If I may, Mr. Warden, can I ask one more thing of this council? We've spent some time here today talking about the expenditure side of the, of the ledger. And I'm very conscious of the fact that Gray County has a hundred thousand population. And when the province changed the um, way that they were going to fund long-term care, they provided a, a differential between urban and, and semi-urban and, and rural communities. And I think in part that was meant to um, recognize the increased cost of, of land in places like the city of Toronto. And that might work well in a more urban context. But one of the things that concerns me as uh, a municipality and a municipal operator is that we are trying to fund the same significant project on a much smaller tax base than our colleagues in larger jurisdictions. And I think there's a conversation to be had there about whether or not this funding model is really one that works for us. And I think there might be other upper tier municipalities who find themselves in the very same position. And is it, is it appropriate to expect that 100,000 people, many of whom are on seniors and on fixed incomes, have the capacity to take on these kinds of costs on the property tax base. So my question to you, given that we're going to AMO next week, is there a place for a conversation about how these projects are funded going forward? Good question. Any comments on that? Mr. Borden? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, and, and I agree that the, the CAO's uh, comments on our tax base are well taken. And, you know, uh, as you know, that's been a focus of mine. And unfortunately, when I, you know, brought it to the attention of county council that we should try to maximize our tax base by making sure we've captured it all, um, there was no interest. So, um, you know, I think it is a very legitimate concern and, and we should be looking at sources of revenue as well as just expenditure. Thank you. Anybody else with comments? I believe that the uh, Madam CAO was talking about the funding formula uh, as it applies to large urban um, centers versus uh, smaller rural communities. Mr. Warden? Yes. Go Mr. ahead. Mr. McQueen here. Uh, I mean, one could use that same argument compared to other large urban centers with regards to our road system. Uh, look at the extra cost that we um, are burdened with because of our winters in Gray County. Uh, we have a quite a road system and, and where other urban centers don't have those, not just even the transportation, like the, the, num the number of kilometers per road, but also the winter maintenance that we have to provide on those roads. So yes, uh, not all of the 444 municipalities in the province of Ontario are alike. And there are some uh, a lot of discrepancies uh, in, in in funding and cost and and uh, but there it's just not with regards maybe to long term care but there are others as well. So I'm uh, our CAO is, is suggesting that maybe there's a room for a conversation with the province about the funding uh, formula. Um, and I gather, Madam CAO, that you're looking for direction of what uh, whether or not council would want you to uh, pursue that type of a conversation, correct? That's correct. Uh, Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And Kim, thanks for bringing that up. And I think uh, it absolutely deserves a conversation with the, uh, the province. I'm just wondering through the warden to you, who you would recommend uh, uh, having that conversation with and uh, what would that look like? Through you, Mr. Warden, we have a delegation with the Ministry of Long-Term Care next week. And uh, it's, you know, I, I was using that as an opportunity to at least raise the question. 
I would certainly support that, Mr. Warden. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so back to the amendment, if I might, <laughs> Councillor Silver's amendment, uh, Madam uh, Clerk, uh, have we had time to put together some language? Yes, sir. Kathy has been um, typing away here, so um, Councillor Silver can can let me know if this if suits what he is looking for. That the main motion be amended to add that staff be requested to seek an independent peer review of the pro forma costs of the long-term care facilities and request evaluation for the existing 66 bed unit at Gray Gables. Yes, that's, uh, that's what I was getting at. That's very great. That's, Thank you. So moved by Councillor Soever, we need a seconder. Uh, Councillor Potter, um, Madam CAO. Can I be um, clear when you say as an independent peer review, are you asking that we that we retain someone other than Colliers, or are are you just looking for um, Colliers to provide background to the number that they've already provided to us? Well, somebody independent would be better. I mean, it's uh, considering the the cost is in the hundreds of millions. A little bit of cost to make sure that we've got our numbers right is not. Um, you know, out of line. I, I would be concerned about the message that that would be sending um, to our consultants that we've just retained. Um, I think it would be, I, I, I'm just gonna give you my best advice. I think it would be um, most appropriate to ask Colliers to provide a some additional detail around the numbers that they're looking at. And if you can feel after that, that, that there are, are gaps or you have concerns or somehow that you don't feel that um, their analysis is satisfactory, then I think that um, we're in a good place to request additional information. I think to, um, I think to go um, outside of that existing relationship when it's brand new would be problematic. Thank you. So councillors, so ever I'm hearing you say that you would prefer to be, as you have uh, moved, independent. So unless you uh, make a change and the seconder agrees to that change, we'll be voting on independent. Uh, councillor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And yes, I would agree with the CEO. I mean, Collier's, is a huge company, um, very reputable. They do this work every day of the week. They are very much on the ground. <laughs> More information from Colliers? Absolutely. I have no problem with that at all because that's what we hired them for. But to turn around and say, no, we don't believe you. We're going to hire Joe down the street here because he's building, I don't know what, is ridiculous. Uh, I can't support this. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Thank you, and I'm less concerned about hurting the feelings of a consultant than I am about looking after the money that our taxpayers oh, give us and geez. expect us to spend. So uh, I would be supporting this. Okay, Councillor Mackey, you're next. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Um, I don't believe uh, you know sitting on both the or on the uh, long-term re redevelopment. Uh, I've been very impressed with Colliers, and I don't believe an independent uh, review would be uh, be required. Certainly, some further information as to how they're coming up with the uh, four hundred thousand dollar figure would be you know, vital to all members of council. But uh, uh, I don't believe uh, an independent uh, review would be required. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Burley. You're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm going to request a recorded vote on the amendment. Okay. Uh, I do have another uh, speaker. Uh, so, Madam CAO, can I go to the other speaker, uh, given that a recorded no. vote has been called for? Yes, you can still. Excellent. So, Councillor Robinson, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you, I would ask that, uh, I would ask and I would also emphasize to County Council that the consultant that we have retained has been um, most efficient in the information that we've provided. And if anything, at a first step here, request for the additional information or the background numbers that can support the presentation at hand. So I would encourage council to um, 
ask for additional information from our existing consultant. Thank you. And uh, regrettably, I will not be supporting the, uh, the motion at hand. Thank you, Councillor Clumpus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ward, and, and I agree. I, I think that uh, dealing with the uh, consultant that we have engaged in this regard uh, is the appropriate way to go ahead uh, for further uh, further decisions. I can't support the amendment as presented either. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll skip over Councillor Sowever and go to Councillor McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Ward, and I'm, I'm wondering if the, the mover and seconder would consider a deferral on this motion just in the sense to get that information first and then consider if, uh, I think it was pointed out that it's about the makeup of those numbers. So I wonder, I probably, it's probably in fairness to say, um, you know, what is those numbers? I think it's only fair to get that information first, but I, I'm not saying that uh, that couldn't be considered afterwards, but I just wonder if the mover and the seconder would consider this as a, consider a deferral on this particular uh, item just until, at least until we get that information from our consultants. I don't know, through you, Mr. Warden, if that's something that could be asked, to, is, is that procedurally, is that something that, or do I have to make a separate motion to ask them to, to, to consider a deferral for that point? I think that what I'm hearing, uh, Deputy Warden, is that the mover and seconder are pretty emphatic that they would like to have an independent uh, review. No. No, oh, well, I, I thought that that's what I had heard from uh, both of you, so if I'm wrong, please, uh, Speak no, up. I haven't had a chance to speak yet on the, the recommendation from the other. So I'd, I'd be happy to um, get the information, um, backup information from um, the consultant um, initially and then see what happens at that point. Um, and, and certainly I, I'd like them to review all of the financial calculations. I know there's been some recent changes to the uh, per diem um, the, the construction subsidy. So um, I'd like them just to review the entire financials and see if they can come up with a number for a value for that existing facility. Okay, so, so Madam CAO, I'm happy I think to what I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to amend it if my seconder will agree. Okay. Madam CAO. I will agree, I will agree provided we leave open the possibility of an independent review. Okay, sorry, I, I keep saying CAO, but I had to say Madam Clerk. <laughs> I knew who you meant, so that's okay. Um, so I was uh, wondering if the mover and seconder, rather than deferring, would withdraw it at this time um, and leave staff to um, work with Colliers to bring that information forward to council. We can put that motion forward after that information is provided to council, um, should anyone wish. Uh, um, I'd, I'd still like to have an, uh, a motion to have them bring that information forward, just so we have it clear in the record. And Councillor Potter? Yes, I'm okay with that. Okay. So, um, um, Madam Clerk, what's being suggested is an amendment to the amendment, um, uh, so that the, the the information that's being sought could be um, from our current uh, consultants and not necessarily from an independent uh, source. Yes. Everyone clear on that? So I, I'm going to recommend that we um, adjust the wording in the original motion with the mover and seconder's permission okay. to um, staff be requested to um, have Colliers provide an overview of the pro forma cost for the long-term care facilities and uh, request evaluation of the existing 66 beds at Gray Gables. Councilor Sowever? Yes, I'm fine with that. And Councilor Potter? Yes, okay. All right, so it sounds like we are ready and I believe that uh, there's to be a recorded vote, right? Yes, Councilor Burley. Um, I'm just wanting to confirm because it has changed slightly if Councilor Burley's still requesting a recorded vote. Mm. Councilor Burley? I'm uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, no, I'm not. Re I will not request a recorded vote of this motion. Okay. Mr. So, Warden, I would I would request the uh, a recorded vote. There we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
Uh, so we're ready to call the vote, Madam Clerk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Councillor Mackey. Sorry, Madam Clerk. Uh, just so I'm clear, we're not we're receiving this information, and the only request is that a little bit further information be provided to council in regards to how the four hundred thousand dollar figure was arrived at. Is that correct? That is correct. Through all this bantering back and forth. Okay, yes. I support that. Okay. Councilor Gamble. In favor. Councilor Burley. Opposed. Uh, Councilor Carlton. In favor. Councilor McLean. In favor. Councilor Desai. Am I unmuted? No. Nope. Yes, you are, sir. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am in support of getting uh, getting more information from colleagues. Thank you. Councillor Patterson. In favor. Warden Hicks. In favor. Councillor Klumpus. In favor. Councillor Keaveny. In favor. Councillor Body. Opposed. Councillor O'Leary? Opposed. I'm sorry, sir. Opposed. Thank you. Councillor Woodbury? Favor. Councillor Millen? Hey. I'm sorry. In favor or opposed, sir? In favor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sampson? Or sorry, I'm sorry, Councillor Potter. In favor. Councillor Soever, I apologize. I've, I've mixed those two up. Um, Councillor Soever. In favor. Councillor Robinson. In favor. And Councillor Hutchinson. In favor. The motion is carried 68 to 22. Okay. Mr. Warden. Yes. Um, just we're on a very tight schedule. Um, and I know that this was raised with um, the redevelopment committee. Um, when I speak to Andrew from Colliers about how quickly he can turn this information around, um, if it can be done, um, I will be looking potentially to have a special meeting just to talk about this so that we can keep the project moving forward. Um, as it stands now, we don't have a second meeting in August and um, we're waiting until um, September the 9th and then two weeks after that, we'll uh, really have a significant impact on um, the project uh, schedule that was set out because we can't let the RFP for the architect until we're firm on, on what we're doing. So um, just to give you a heads up that uh, if I can move this along, I'll do my best to do that. And thank you, Madam uh, CAO. Is, uh, the information is gonna come back to the redevelopment to committee or to council? Probably most expedient to come back to council. That was my thought. Right. Okay. Uh, Councilor McQueen, you have your hand up. Yeah, this is sort of speaking uh, forward in the sense that the motion now it's amended is to uh, receive this report with the other amendment that's been passed. I guess the question is, is if there's going back to a special meeting or if there is going to be a reconsideration or a new notice of motion that I think it's also important that other information is collected and, uh, you know, they talk about a crisis. Well, some might consider there's a crisis in long-term care, especially after what's happened uh, through the last 16 months. So I think if some other avenue is going to be looked upon in the sense of changing the direction of county council, I think other information needs to come forward as well if that's at that point. So I'll just make that comment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I believe that uh, Council Desai has indicated that there may very well be a notice of motion coming at the end of this meeting, but we'll wait to see. All right, um, it is now um, five minutes. 
sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Warden. We do need to vote on the main motion now as amended. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought that we did vote on that. Okay, so um, the original it, movers are still there as amended. I'm going to call uh, the vote. Is there anyone opposed to the motion that's been, as it's been amended? I see no hands, and therefore that is carried. Thank you. So it's 11.55. I'm going to suggest a 10-minute uh, break and that we come back at uh, five minutes past noon. Okay? See you all then. 12.05.
Okay. How are we doing? I'm still waiting for a number. I don't think we're at quorum yet. You have 12 that I can see, Mr. Warden, so you do have quorum. Okay, then I'm going to push us along um, and the others will join if they're able. Okay, we're on to item uh, 6B. Welcome back, everyone. We're dealing now with the budget assumptions uh, and timetable with uh, Mary Lou on deck. This item has been moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Body. Is he here? Yes, he is. Perfect. So, Mary Lou, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. So, this report provides preliminary high-level budget assumptions and the timeline for the preparation and delivery of the 2022 <laughs> budget for your consideration. And just of note, there are no significant changes to the timelines or assumptions report, aside from the onboarding of additional finance staff who will be key to the development of these budgets. So they're going to begin work on the budgets over the next few weeks. Um, one of the significant challenges continues to be COVID and the unknown impact on operations, as well as any associated funding that we should um, include in the 22 budget. So some budget assumptions. Um, we're going to budget assessment growth will be estimated at the previous five-year average, and we'll update that when the 22 assessment roll is received. Supplementary taxation will be based on historical trends and impacts forecast net of write-offs. We develop utility costing based on information that we receive from LAS. Gas and diesel costs for transportation and paramedic services would be based on market conditions and consumption. Insurance costs will be updated as we receive information um, for the county policy and housing policy, which is, uh, is separate from the overall county umbrella. Salaries and benefits will be budgeted based on current negotiated contracts or estimates if contract has expired or will expire in 2022, as well as information from our HR team. Non-union and council compensation will be based upon compensation formulas in comparison with current union contracts. For provincial funding, we're gonna budget at levels either provided by the province or best estimate based on history if we haven't received funding announcements. And for service delivery that we do on behalf of the province, we'll follow ministry guidelines. The draft budget will include amounts provided by, approved by council rather, for a 1.21% tax levy for asset management, 1% for the attainable housing fund, and half of 1% for healthcare initiative fund to provide funding for contributions to hospital campaign um, construction projects. The following report presented by um, our asset management coordinator talks about our building condition assessments and how we are using those um, to determine project priorities and estimated costing to ensure that there's sufficient funding to maintain the county's assets. Um, in speaking again to COVID, we're going to budget for long-term care based on ministry directives. Uh, purchase of PPE will remain at current levels and continue until otherwise directed by public health and ministry directives. Any eligible costs that may be funded from Safe Restart Agreement and the Provincial COVID Recovery Funding will be utilized. And the budget for investment income will remain low. Um, this impacts the ability to transfer any investment funds that exceed 1% of the levy to the one-time funding reserve. And that is used to assist with providing funding for non-recurring expenditures. We will continue to monitor assumptions uh, and refine them until the budget is finalized for presentation at Committee of the Whole. We had a hoped to return to a November presentation as it allows departments to move forward with procuring capital projects. However, with the unknown impact of COVID as well as onboarding a number of new staff, we decided that it was better to maintain a late January pre budget presentation. This also allows us to use the 2022 returned role and to confirm 2021 assessment growth. 
The timetable attached in the report proposes a budget presentation to Committee of the Whole with a date now of January 28th that would give a target budget approval date of February 10th. And that's where we'd bring the bylaw approving the estimates of revenue and expenditures. Departments with significant capital projects can bring forward a report to council for pre-budget approval so they can move forward with procurement. And then a resolution of council is required in order to, in order to have the expenditure authorized. So the budget process began with the presentation of 10-year capital forecast. So the first year of the forecast is going to be used in the 2022 budget. Corporate departments provide assumptions to assist the other departments with things like the cost of technology, insurance, utilities, wages, benefits, et cetera. Finance staff work on budget worksheets and assist de departmental staff with their 22 budget and their 2021 uh, year in projection. There are a number of reviews internally before the budget comes to Committee of the Whole. Team leads review with departments before the drafts are presented to the manager of accounting budgets, the CAO, and myself. Senior management will also discuss the submissions, and the Long-Term Care Committee of Management will see their respective draft budget November 9th. Council will receive a report detailing the budget overview and background November 25th, and the draft budget will be finalized in December so that the package can be built and posted on the county's website January 17th. And as mentioned, then it will be discussed at the January 28th budget. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions, anyone? I do not see any hands. So we're looking to receive um, and that uh, the proposed budget assumptions be incorporated into our 2022 um, draft budget and that the schedule is 2022 budget be approved. So I call the question, is there anyone opposed to the motion? That is carried, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to item um, <clears throat> 6C, the building condition assessments and reserve fund uh, studies uh, with Amanda on deck and moved by Councillor O'Leary and seconded by Councillor Woodbury. Amanda, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here this afternoon with a report on the 2020 2021 building condition assessments or BCAs for short. It's recommended that this report be received for information and that staff utilize the BCAs and reserve fund studies as a resource in developing asset management plans, capital forecasts, and annual budgets, as well as for long-term planning. BCAs are a critical tool in understanding the condition and the future maintenance requirements of the buildings that are owned, operated, or provided funding by Gray County. RFP CS0120 was awarded to Walter Fady in September 2020 for consulting services, including BCAs, calculating facility condition indexes, or FCIs, and performing reserve fund studies and energy audits for all 94 county building locations. The majority of site inspections were completed by Walter Fady during late 2020, and then reports were drafted, reviewed, and revised in 2021, with the final reports and spreadsheets being received in July. Deliverables received from Walter Fady for each site included a final report providing a comprehensive analysis of all building components, FCI calculations, energy audit details and recommendations, a complete capital forecast Excel workbook, and a raw data Excel file for each building componentizing the building's parts, as well as thorough elevator and lift reports for sites where applicable. The detailed reports provided information on component estimated useful lifespans, the current remaining life, repair and replacement recommendations, and estimates of all associated costs. All buildings were assigned an FCI rating, which is calculated as the percentage of the total renewal and repair costs to the total building replacement costs. And so therefore, the smaller the number, the better the condition of the building. The overall average 2021 FCI of all buildings assessed before considering repairs to be completed in 2021 was 1.75%, indicating that overall the county's building portfolio is in good condition. As can be seen in the 2021 columns of the FCI chart that begins on six, page 66 of today's agenda package, most of the county's buildings are in very good condition with FCIs below 1%. 
There were a few outliers, though, that were calculated to have FCIs greater than 10% in 2021, indicating they're currently in poor condition. These included the housing Flesherton apartment building, which, which is scheduled for major renovations yet in 2021 and some more in 2022, and those renos will greatly improve that building's condition. The other two buildings are in the transportation portfolio, with those being the Meaford Shed, which is meeting the needs of its users in its current condition, and the Dundalk Sand Dome, which is planned to be decommissioned upon construction of the new Patrol D facility. The 10-year average FCI was also calculated to indicate the condition that county buildings would be in if no repairs were made over the next 10 years. As can be seen in the final two columns of the chart beginning on page 66, many of the buildings would greatly deteriorate over the 10 years if recommended repairs were not undertaken. This is typical of building facilities as they require regular upkeep to remain in good condition and be fully functional. In conclusion, the BCA work completed with Walter Fady is a great resource providing important information that the county can rely upon to inform asset management, budget, and 10-year capital planning. The information gained from this work will be consulted upon and further refined for use in all of those forms of strategic planning going forward. It's important to note that this information provides an objective expert third-party view on the actions that should be taken for each building's components assuming that the building is intended to continue to be used in its current capacity. The information provided from this objective perspective can then be used to inform decision-making when determining the acceptable balance in the constant trade-off between benefits, costs, and risks for each building asset. The information will be used as a base and then modified to consider the observations of county asset managers in the field, as well as any recent strategic decisions made by council in all plans that are provided by staff to council in the not so distant future. The completion of these studies marks a significant step forward in the county's asset management work, as we now have updated data on all existing building components to rely upon for the next asset management plan. And with that, I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Amanda. Council, any questions here? Very good, very thorough. Thank you for the presentation. I'll call the question. Is there anyone opposed to the motion before you? Seeing no hands, that is carried. Thank you very much, Amanda. Okay, we're next on to item uh, 6D, uh, dealing with Great Transit uh, Route, our uh, year in review. It is moved with Stephanie on deck, of course, uh, moved by Councillor Keaveney and seconded by Councillor Body. Stephanie, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm happy to be here today. So good afternoon, Gray County Council. Um, I'm here today to provide you an overview of the Gray Transit Route, a year in review. I'm presenting to you today ahead of our one year anniversary uh, because I will be going on mat leave in a few short weeks. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce my um, colleague who will be replacing me in my absence. His name is Charles Fitzsimmons. Uh, he is on the call, so if Charles would like to say Hello to everyone. Um, that will put a face to the name. And Charles will be supported by Kim while I'm away. Charles is being shy. Oh, he's there. He's just, oh. I don't, I don't know and if you're- on my second screen. <laughs> Say something, Charles, so we can see you. Oh, you have having difficulty seeing me? Oh, there we go. <laughs> no, you're there now. Oh, good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be introduced to you. I uh, don't want to take up a lot of your time, but I look forward to seeing you in the future as I carry on the good work of uh, Great Transit Routes. And uh, I've been working with Stephanie and with the CAO to uh, get up to speed, and I'll be taking over next week as Stephanie takes time to attend to more important matters. Hey, welcome Thank on you, board. <laughs> Wonderful. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take you through our presentation today. Okay, and you can all see that there? Oh yeah. Wonderful. Let's get my mouse. 
There we go. Sorry about that. On the right screen. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. So hard to believe, but we started the service last year in September of 2020. And here we are today in August now, um, but all the data in this survey, this presentation, sorry, goes to um, July. So today I plan on reviewing our ridership statistics with you, our successes and good news stories, our challenges and our opportunities, our marketing efforts to date and our future plans, our survey results, and our opportunities for future growth. So throughout this project, Council has asked that I measure our successes and our feedback in a variety of platforms. So today I'm going to share the hard numbers and the verbal feedback we have received. To date, we have had 2,583 people ride our bus. As you can see, in July, um, we had 415 people ride in total. And prior to that, it was a little bit less in June, and we've significantly seen an increase month over month, the ridership has improved. So whether that's a result of pandemic restrictions lifting or um, simply more and more people are finding out about it. I'm going to highlight each individual route just for reference. So route one, the ridership between Owen Sound and Dundalk, as you can see, it's the blue here. It has increased significantly month over month. Again, you see the ebbs and flows as a result of the pandemic and just different things happening in people's lives. And uh, the orange is Dundalk to Orangeville. Most recently, something to note is that weekend service did begin in July between Dundalk and Orangeville with one route that runs um, in the morning from Owen Sound all the way to Orangeville and the return trip at the end of the day. So there were uh, nine people that used that in July, um, but I do foresee that increasing over the next coming couple months. Route three, we have Owen Sound to Meaford and Meaford to Blue Mountains, which is route four. Um, and again, you can see that month over month the ridership has increased. Um, we did see a bit of a drop off in July and I'm not sure what that, why that is. Um, perhaps it's a result of um, the, the Delta variant becoming more prevalent in our area or simply because people are away on summer holidays and enjoying, um, able to enjoy their backyard a bit more. Route five, Owen Sound to Wyerton. Um, this is very exciting that we see a huge increase in July. Um, in July, we see 73 people using the service. Um, we also did an extension with a partnership with South Bruce Peninsula. So originally the bus only ran three days a week between Owen Sound and Wyerton and South Bruce Peninsula uh, added additional funding to the service so that we, we could extend it to Sauble Beach. And we now operate uh, Friday to Monday, including holiday Mondays. So that is, a direct result is to, to, in my opinion, as to why we see such a spike, um, because people are now using it to get to the beach um, for employment and just um, for fun. Route six, Flesherton to Walkerton. Um, as you can see here, it hasn't been our most popular route, um, although we have seen some increases month over month. Um, but in my opinion, um, as more people learn about the service and the opportunities it provides, and the connections that you can make into the ghost system or connecting into our Owen Sound to Orangeville system, um, more and more people are using the service and we do foresee it increasing in the future. However, I will discuss later on in the presentation how I do think um, an increase in service would significantly help the ridership along this route. I also wanted to highlight um, the website data. So here you can see um, when we launched the service that in September, um, 2,394 2, people used our, our website, our gray.ca slash GTR. Um, and I have here in the other column, the booking site, it shows how many people, when they got to our landing page, click the next link to take them to the, the site where you actually book your ride. Um, so as you can see, it has increased. Um, obviously, the first month was the most popular when people were learning about it and I guess finding out about the website. Um, and then as time has gone on now, um, we did see a bit of a dip in January, February, but we were in our significant um, shutdown at that point. And then now it's starting to come back up. 
Um, and as you can see, um, our booking site has always had um, a significant, well, month over month has had a significant increase um, from where we kind of were down in February to now where we're up to in June. Um, so things are steadily increasing and I think that's reflective in our ridership. So again, our website data goes along with what our ridership data is saying that more people are using the service as they find out about it and are enjoying it. Um, our phone call volume, um, this is the phone line that we have to provide for individuals who don't want to use the website or aren't able to use the website to book. Um, so here again, you can see the same thing, the same trend is happening where more people are finding out about the service and are using the phone service to book. Um, also something to highlight in March, we began accepting cash payments and those needed to be booked over the phone. Um, so that also has increased our call volume because more people are now booking um, over the phone to pay for their rides in cash. So our successes. So throughout this bumpy road of a year that we've experienced, um, we have been reliable for all of our riders. We only had to cancel our service twice and this was only a result of the fact that the roads closed. So when the roads closed, we weren't able to run the bus um, for obvious reasons. But in that saying that, I should add that because of our existing system and because we ask our riders to book in advance, when we knew the roads were getting bad and we knew that they were going to close in the near future as the reports were coming in, um, we were able to reach out to those riders. And we were able to contact them and let them know that their ride needed to be canceled or help them arrange for transportation home at an earlier time to ensure the safety of all of our passengers and our ride and our drivers. Um, so we never left anybody stranded. And I've also heard um, from other transit agencies that travel such large distances similar to ourselves that having um, the fact that we ask our riders to book in advance and that they can book a return trip back home is really something that riders have become reliant on and, and find very helpful. Um, what I've heard from other transit agencies that travel our distance is people who can't book their trip home are sometimes being stuck in destinations that they don't want to be in. Um, because uh, when they go to get on the bus to go home, now the bus is full. Um, and that would be rather upsetting um, because to use our bus to get say from Owen Sound all the way to Orangeville or from Owen Sound to Blue Mountains um, and then have to take a cab back home at the end of the day if you couldn't get a ride home back on our bus um, that would be upsetting but for all of our riders um, they can book their seat in advance so they know whether they will be able to get a return trip home so that gives them the added security um, and makes us become a very reliable service for people. Additionally we are affordable um, we hear time and time again, people will say, oh, wow, it only costs this much. Um, and that's been a really great news story for many residents. And it also has resulted in removing barriers for people who have financial constraints. We have received some positive feedback, which I'll review with you in a moment. Our community outreach, although it's been restricted as a result of COVID, um, I have done my best and I have presented to you before um, and to other groups um, about the fact that I've presented virtually to the YMCA and their employment services. I prevent, presented to the Beaver Valley Outreach Program, so their seniors um, programs there and let them know about the service. Um, and I'm happy to present to any groups that you would like or you hear from that would be interested in a presentation. So we're always working um, to let people know about our service and people are always happy to hear about it. Um, we can do this once more and more as the pandemic restrictions lift, and we also would like to, in the future, um, attend festivals and um, celebrations where we could have perhaps a booth and let people know about our service as well. Another great success is, as I said, we've extended service into Salvo Beach uh, and, and now offer weekend service to Georgian Bluffs, Squireton, um, via Owen Sound. Uh, that was through a partnership with South Bruce Peninsula and Bruce County. And we've added the weekend service in a partnership with the town of Shelburne between Dundalk, Shelburne and Orangeville. As well, we added bike racks on all buses. So these bike racks now assist individuals with active transportation, leisure opportunities, and they also provide the option for some additional connections for first mile and last mile. 
So perhaps you don't necessarily live or work or exactly where our stop is. So now you can take your bike with you and you can connect to more destinations um, by bike. So our good news. So rider one has expressed that they live in Meaford and they do not drive and they ride um, the GTR to come to Owen Sound for shopping and to attend doctor's appointments at the hospital. Rider two lives in Thornbury and they ride the bus with their friends almost daily to visit family and to seek business opportunities. Rider three travels from Owen Sound to Meaford for work. The current schedule allows them to get to work on time and return home at the end of the day. Rider four said they moved to Meaford recently and they use the GTR to shop in Owen Sound. Rider five lives in Meaford with her son and they travel regularly to Owen Sound for appointments and they enjoy being able to achieve the same day travel on the GTR. Rider six lives in Owen Sound and travels to appointments in Blue Mountain and back again. Rider seven uses the GTR to travel from Meaford to Blue Mountains for work and appointments, making connections to the Collingwood Transit. They also noted that they don't have a car. Rider eight travels between Owen Sound and Thornbury to visit friends and family and find uh, earning opportunities. Um, Owen Sound to Wyerton and Sauble Beach. So we have rider nine said that they recently moved to Wyerton from the Gulf area and they use the GTR to get from Wyerton to Owen Sound to attend appointments as well as they make connections to the ghost service to get to Guelph and visit family. Uh, rider 10 travels frequently to, with friends to Sawwell Beach from Owen Sound. Um, they do not drive, but they love to travel to the beach. Rider 11 and 12, they are different in different people, um, but they are both individuals with visual impairments who like to ride our bus to go to the beach. Uh, they actually express to our drivers and our staff um, that at times uh, the city sounds um, in Owen Sound are just a little bit overwhelming for them. So they actually really like to be able to walk along the beach as they feel safe and secure while they're there. Um, and it has some different um, sensory opportunities for them that they can't achieve in the city. So this has been a great service for them as well. Uh, between Flesherton and Walkerton, we've received some positive feedback as well. Um, we have an individual who travels from Hanover to Walkerton to visit with their child. And Rider 14 owns business in Walkerton and Owen Sound, and they use the GTR to travel from Hanover to Owen Sound, making connections from Kitchener, Waterloo area to purchase stock for their business. Lastly, we are going to highlight Owen Sound to Orangeville. So we have a university student that lives in Shelburne and travels to and from work at Chapman's Ice Cream in Markdale for the night shift. We have another individual who travels from Flesherton to Owen Sound for work. Uh, rider 17 lives between Dundalk and Orangeville and rides to see family and make appointments and to find work. Rider 18 travels from their home in Shelburne to Dundalk for work. We have riders 19 and 20 who travel from Skyview Motel to Shelburne and Orangeville for appointments. Rider 21 said that this service has actually changed their life. Uh, they live in Flesherton and now they're able to take, they actually ride their bike um, to the Flesherton Arena. They get on the bus and then they travel either to Owen Sound or Orangeville to shop or go to appointments. Riders 22 and 23, they are similar to one of our other riders who now lives in Dundalk and is able to work at Chapman's. And they ride the bus there and work the night shift and then come back home in the morning. And rider 24 uses the GTR to travel from the GTA back home to, to Gray County. Excuse me. So we're hearing this more and more often. And as you can see from the, this verbal feedback, in addition to the hard numbers from the ridership, the GTR has helped many Gray County residents travel throughout Gray County and beyond. So not only are we helping people connect within our communities, we're also helping make those connections to Toronto, to Barrie, to other places and help people have their needs be met. So of course we've had challenges like every other transit system. But one thing that I can say for sure is the fact that our service is an essential service. Um, throughout the pandemic, people have relied on it to get to work, to visit friends or get to um, doctor's appointments, sorry. And these things, while friends were discouraged at one point, um, we do know that social interactions and meeting safely was important for many people. And this service has allowed people to travel for those essential reasons. So I want to make sure that council and 
everyone is, is aware of the fact that everybody who rode the bus, um, we did encourage that on our website, but it was for essential travel only. And uh, we, we encourage that through social media as well. And we feel that um, we achieved that through all of our safety measures as well. And I just, I just want to express and share that I think that, as you can see, um, the people who used our bus over the last year definitely used it for essential reasons. Um, I feel like if they had other opportunities to travel in other forms, they may have used those. Um, so this is something that I think is very essential for many people. But the challenges of the pandemic, of course, were the fact that we had to ask many people to stay at home over the last year. Um, there was many social distance requirements that came into place. And as a result of that, we had to reduce our seating capacity on our buses. I have asked and reached out to public health as to when it will be safe to increase our seating capacities again, and we'll keep you posted on what we find out. Um, obviously, we've seen a decrease in our transit demand. More people are working from home and many key destinations were closed. And as I was um, kind of hinting at there too, our marketing and promotion efforts haven't been able to be um, as robust as we would like them to be because we've been only able to promote for essential travel only. So we haven't been able to get out there and tell people about our awesome service and encourage people to travel for entertainment and fun quite yet. Um, but we do look forward to being able to do that in the near future. So some of our opportunities, um, we see an attraction of youth and seniors being an area that we can grow our ridership. Um, that I think the youth are one group in particular that really once we can open up um, and people can, you know, go to movies and people can go to uh, the ski hill and you can go to restaurants and things like that. Um, I really think that the youth will be that market that we can tap into um, because the service will now be able to provide them with the freedom and flexibility of if they don't have a car yet or they're not able to drive or maybe their parents can only pick them up from one destination and not bring them both ways. Um, this service may give them that freedom. Um, and similarly for seniors, um, this service will now help them get to doctor's appointments or likewise visit their friends and family um, and go enjoy some social experiences as well. I think we have some more employees and employers that we can capture. Um, although I do feel that we need to have um, some more, uh, more consistency with our scheduling and offer more days of the week in order to be super beneficial for our employees and our employers. Um, but by doing that, increasing our service, we will be able to capture some more consistent riders um, and not just the occasional rider. So post COVID, we have the opportunity to capture entertainment and social experiences. And I believe with an expansion in our service, we will become a more viable car alternative. Our marketing to date, um, we have had digital display ads that just simply promoted and let people know that we had a service, that it existed, that it was affordable and where the bus ran. Um, so those, if you were looking up on a newspaper on your on a computer um, or an iPad or a phone, our ads were displayed from April to um, July and uh, they were on a number of post media sites. We do plan to do a social media campaign between September and December to capture the a different audience. We had radio running uh, on Country 93 from May 10th to July 3rd and on Country 105 we're offering from July 3rd to October 9th uh, radio ads. In December, as you recall, I went around and I promoted all of our GTR services through all of Gray, Bruce, and Dufferin County. And in July of 2021, most recently, I went out and promoted the additional service to Sauble Beach. We have also added newspaper ads. So we had ads in the Gray, Bruce this week, uh, the Sun Times, the Post, the Dundalk Herald and Flushington Advance, and the Shelburne Free Press. These are just some examples of the ads that we posted. So the GTR travels between, and we highlighted where we travel, travel for $5 or less. Owen Sound to Wireton. This was an ad that we put out to let people know that we offered this new service. This ad was created to let people know that we had bike racks. And this one to highlight the fact that we have everyday service between um, Dundalk, Shelburne and Orangeville. So most recently we completed a survey 
And with this survey, we asked all of our residents, well, 149 of them who responded, um, how, what they would like to see and how they would like to see the service improved. So over the last year, we've heard from a number of residents that they would like the service to be more frequent, offered more days of the week, travel to more destinations, and to help residents improve their quality of life by giving them more opportunities to travel to shopping and leisure, employment, visit family and medical appointments. So we heard this at feedback throughout the year, through phone calls, through conversations with drivers and passengers, um, and also in emails that which I've received. So when we did this survey, we thought we'd give residents the opportunity to drop pins on a map and tell us exactly where they would like the bus to be stopping and to tell us when and how often. So from the, those survey results, uh, we learned that new stop locations should be added in Owen Sound, Chatsworth, Dundalk, Shelburne, Mono, Blue Mountains, uh, Georgian Bluffs, Wyerton, Hanover, and Brockton. Um, and in addition to that, it was suggested that we make our connections stronger between the GO Transit, calling the Transit, Owen Sound, and if possible, the new GHOST service as well. So I have had a number of conversations with GO Transit. I've also spoken with Collingwood Transit, and I'm able to review the Owen Sound Transit schedule, and it works. Uh, it's often quite frequent, so that makes it very easy to follow along. Um, and we do plan on improving those connections in the fall of 2021. So in the fall, we do plan on increasing our stop locations and adding some new stops and changing our schedule to meet the needs of our residents based off of the survey results that we've received. So lastly, um, my ask. So my ask of you today is to consider including two, 223,000 uh, in the 2022 budget to allow for the GTR to operate more days a week for a one-year pilot. I believe 2022 is the time to consider this pilot as the cost to gather this data and offer this level of service will never be lower. The success of our transit system hinges on being reliable, affordable and frequent. While some routes haven't had the ridership we would like, to be fair, we've been operating this entire year throughout a pandemic. The life of this service has happened during a pandemic, which has been turbulent for all of us. And according to our residents and our employers, some routes don't simply offer, operate enough days per week. So for residents to leave their car at home, to get a job, and be able to rely on the transit, it does need to operate more days per week. So my proposal today would be to increase um, Route 1, which runs between Owen Sound and Dundalk to seven days per week for a one-year pilot, including holidays. Uh, Dundalk to Orangeville, seven days per week, including holidays. Owen Sound to Meaford, uh, seven days per week, and Meaford to Blue, seven days per week. All of these would include holidays. And to note the feedback I've received specifically between Owen Sound and Blue Mountains is um, many uh, employers have reached out from the Blue Mountains and because there's it is a tourism destination, uh, standard Monday to Friday, even we did operate Wednesday to Sunday, is just not enough because many employers, um, staff have a rolling schedule where they don't necessarily work a set standard seven, five days a week. Um, it rolls and it changes. So having the flexibility and offering service more days per week would be very helpful. Owen Sound to Wyerton running Monday to Friday would allow for individuals to seek employment opportunities. And here I'm only suggesting that we run to Hanover and I have spoken with Bruce County in regards to supporting the transit running from Hanover to Walkerton. I'm suggesting that we operate that route five days per week as well. Um, again, for the same reasons of offering stable and reliable transportation for employment for many of our residents. So thank you for your time. Um, does anyone have any questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie um, and Charles. Uh, I know you're listening in intently. Um, I do see a number of questions. It's, uh, first of all, I would say, Stephanie, it's nice to see that this uh, program has moved from wish to reality and uh, our little baby is starting to do more than crawl, right? Yes. Uh, uh, Councillor Desai. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Stephanie on the, on the news uh, of her upcoming uh, break. Um, I, I wish all the very best to you and your family. 
Uh, also, thank you very much for the presentation. I've always been uh, uh, super big on, on transit. And to me, um, one of the arguments for transit, I remember when we were initially talking about this, was that it'll connect uh, people who require affordable housing uh, to jobs which perhaps exist in different communities. And I forget the rider number, but we did have someone who traveled from Shelburne all the way to Markdale in order to be able to work at Chapman's Ice Cream. So uh, to me, um, $223,000 to, uh, to uh, provide a higher level of service is, is absolutely a no-brainer. It's not, a, it's not a, um, uh, a service that affects a particular demographic or a particular age group. It's a service that is used and appreciated, if I might add, by uh, seniors as well as younger people and people who are still working. So to me, I think um, supporting the uh, ASK would, is, is a no-brainer. And uh, really, thank you very much, Stephanie, for the report. Thank you, uh, Warden Hanks. Thank you. Councillor Potter, you're next. Thank you, Warden. Uh, and through you to Stephanie, uh, I, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of local media included in the uh, in in the promotion of this, and I just wondered if if you've considered looking at uh, the Collingwood uh, radio stations and uh, and newspapers, uh, either the Enterprise Bulletin or or Collingwood uh, today. I guess it is the online one. Uh, we do have a, a local news sheet, but. Uh, we, we are sort of forced into using the Collingwood newspaper as our local paper for advertising. I'm sure someone at the town uh, of the Blue Mountains could help you uh, find out where we do our advertising because um, that tends to be the media that people here use. Uh, through you, your worship. Um, yes, that, that's great. Thank you, Councillor Potter for providing that information. So uh, to be clear, I guess, the radio ads, so we did original radio ads um, once the service launched. The most recent radio ads, the reason that they're not targeted to your specific area is because they are highlighting the new service that goes to Sawa Beach and the new service that goes to Shelburne um, and Dundalk and Orangeville. Um, but your point is well taken and I will make those notes uh, and I'm sure Charles has those as well. And I will create that connection for Charles to your uh, economic development staff and to your director of uh, corporate services or community services, sorry, um, because I agree we could improve our marketing uh, and we can definitely do that in the near future or in the new year as well. So thank you for those suggestions. Okay, next is Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Warden and through you, I have been incredibly impressed with this <laughs> Gray County initiative and the evolution that has taken place and uh, certainly it supports our uh, Gray County residents. So uh, well done, um, Stephanie. And uh, this is incredibly supportive of uh, Gray County. I often refer back to a, a presentation that we had early on in our term from the uh, Four County Labor Board. And um, the takeaway from that presentation for me was that one of the barriers to employment and quality of life for Gray County residents and other residents that were referred to is uh, transit. And here Gray County has worked on one of those barriers with success. And you'll note that in the, the document, supporting documentation to the report, references made to quality of life for the enhancement of it, as well as to uh, connect into employment opportunities. So I'm encouraged with the results that we have. Really happy with the GTR um, communication that's taken place. This is really valuable. Many residents have referenced this uh, to me. I want to make a point, and that is on page two of the report. I believe it's paragraph four. It talks about, um, it zeroes in on where, where we need to go next. And that is the uh, enhanced uh, service, uh, increasing the number of days, and also increasing uh, the number of days for the Route 6, which is Flesherton to, um, White, uh, to Walkerton. And then, um, which I'm very much supportive of, of the enhancements overall to the uh, uh, GTR. In the um, financial and resource implications chart, Route 6 is referred to as Owen Sound to Hanover. 
And I'm wondering if that is, uh, does that need to be changed back to um, Flesherton to Walkerton? Thank you. Oh, and I will be supporting this uh, uh, recommendation at hand. If I may, Gordon? Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. So uh, the reason that we started to change the language to say for Route 6 Owen Sound to Hanover um, is so that way people, residents, can make that connection that via Flesherton, you can go all the way from Owen Sound to Hanover. Um, so we, we were finding that residents and riders weren't sure that they could make that connection um, or that it existed. So we are starting to work towards changing that language to say Owen Sound to Hanover, um, just because they can connect in Flesherton to go, essentially they could also go um, to Orangeville, um, but our bus starts in Owen Sound and does go that way. So that's the reason that we've changed that language, um, just to provide some clarity and other information for opportunities. So just a supplemental uh, for clarity, and that is that the route, the existing route does not change, but the um, route um, reference or the route label will just change for increased uh, clarity of, uh, of the overall service. That is correct, exactly. yes. The bus will still run along. Uh, there will be one single bus that runs along uh, Gray Road 4, and it connects into Route 1 and Route 2 in Flushton, and then riders can go um, either direction. I appreciate the integrated um, service level here. Thank you very much, and well done, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. I'm going to go next to our CAO. Thanks, Mr. Warden. <clears throat> and I just, in, in addition to the great work that Stephanie's done on this project, I really want to give a shout out to um, Adam McKechnie, who's um, the franchisee that owns the driver's seat uh, franchise that's been working with us. Adam and his team have been the most committed and um, accommodating people that you could ever ask for. He has gone above and beyond so many times for individual riders, um, for Stephanie and myself trying to um, improve this service, um, make things work for folks. And just, it's been such a pleasure to work with Adam. And I don't think we would be where we are today without that. And so I just want to say a big thank you to him and acknowledge it publicly because we have been so blessed to have him as part of this team. Thank you, Councillor Desai. You Thank you, Lord Next, I, I, for, I was so effusive in my praise, I forgot to ask a question. Um, my question, Lord Next, for you to Stephanie is whether um, uh, whether we're advertising the GTR to uh, to our, our visitors, our tourists who usually live in the GTA, if we're advertising the GTR to them in order to um, sort of uh, promote using the, the transit option to get to Savile Beach. Uh, and alleviate some of the traffic issues that we routinely uh, have along that route. Um, and, and as well, Mr. Wooden, I'd like to, uh, it's been a while since I've taken a shot at Councillor Milne. So um, I'd like to point out that uh, when Gray Highland sends our people to the county, we send our very best. Uh, and uh, Stephanie Stewart is an, is, is, a, is an example of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh through you, your worship, and thank you, Councillor Desai. So uh, to that point, um, yes, we actually have had a number of people that live in the GTA and our user service. As a result of COVID, we haven't been um, really promoting to our tours because we haven't been encouraging a lot of tourism up here. Um, but I have been working. Uh, I do know my colleague, um, Allison, has it on her radar. And when she feels it's appropriate, she will begin to share our advertisements um, with the tourism page that we have geared exactly to our, our visitors to Gray County. Um, but we have had those conversations actually with the Go Transit staff um, at Metrolinx. And when it is appropriate, I believe they will also be promoting that you can travel from the GTA all the way up to experience a weekend in nature or however they want to spin that language. Um, they have expressed that they do have marketing dollars that they could put eventually towards it. Um, so we just need to kind of wait for when that timing is right and appropriate to encourage visitors to come back. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, for that answer. And I'm very, very uh, intrigued by that second part of your response about your conversation with, uh, with staff at Metrolinx. Uh, 
that, that's really good news. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think it's uh, time now to call the question. We've had very good discussion, very good presentation. Uh, so anyone opposed to the motion to receive and to um, fund the, the request for the enhanced funding? No one being opposed. I'm gonna say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Charles, again. Nice to have you on board. And Stephanie, good luck to you and your uh, family and that special uh, appointment you have to be introduced to your child. Thank you very much, Your Worship. All right, Council. Um, I'm going to suggest that we break for lunch uh, and I'm going to suggest that we come back. I know that things are pressed, but some of us have a really hard time eating quickly. So uh, if it's okay with everyone, could we come back at 12.35? That'll give us a full 40 minutes. Yeah, you mean 135? Yeah, my apologies. 135, yes. It's 1255. So 135, if we could. We'll see you all then. See you then.
Good lunch, Sue. Yes. <laughs> I had steak and chicken and potatoes. Really? Can you believe it? Yeah. Oh. Leftovers. Oh. <laughs> and it was all mixed up in a blender, wasn't it? Because there's no way you sat and did all that. <laughs> <laughs> little little bites, little tastes. Oh, yeah. That, it was very small. I only got through half of it. But it was good. I hear you, Olivia. Leftovers from the barbecue last night. Getting my chin. There we go. <clears throat> Okay, it's that magical time. How are we doing for quorum? You have quorum, sir. We're just waiting on a few oh, more to no. join, but. No worries. Olivia, how are we on your end? Everything is good. Okay. <clears throat> Am I okay to proceed? If we have quorum, I prefer to proceed and let the others uh, chime in. Yes, we have almost everyone here, so you are good to proceed, Mr. Ward. Excellent. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I know I did. Uh, and I even got a lot of it finished, <laughs> not all. Okay, we're on to, <clears throat> excuse me, item 6E with Pat on deck. And uh, we are dealing with the Feversham uh, Sand Dome update. Uh, it is moved by Councillor Woodbury and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Uh, Pat, you have the floor. Hey, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, so I, I think the first question is, things haven't changed that much in Feversham. Um, as far as Gray's interest since 2016. So, you know, the question is, why is this report coming back now as the, um, the motion is, is fairly similar to what we wanted in 2016. I think there's just a couple things to mention here. One that, it, you know, was a previous council. So this is a chance to talk about uh, the Feversham facility that we share with Gray Highlands um, with everybody. And uh, the other thing is that the, the structure has deteriorated pretty severely. Um, in the last five years. So um, just for some background, it's a shared facility with Gray Highlands. Uh, we own 55% and Gray Highlands owns 45%. So after the motion in 2016, we had sent out a few letters uh, to Gray Highlands that basically we, we wanted out of the facility because we haven't used it since 2012. So we never, although we never received a formal response for Gray Highlands, um, we got some responses from 
uh, you know, some of the counselors and we had kind of been speaking with Greyhounds, public work staff and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that the biggest concern was just the fact that they were, uh, there is um, kind of a, maybe Kevin uh, McNabb could speak to this later, but there is a response time uh, kind of lag maybe around, around Feversham, um, kind of Feversham, Eugenia area. So uh, Greyhounds want us to investigate um, whether or not that would be a future home of a paramedic base sometime. And, and then the other thing is the patrol D depot initiative got going and we were kind of just feeling um, that potentially if the patrol D site that we bought was far enough West, there is a chance that we might get the odd load out of there that maybe we would still want a facility there. Um, after we looked at our last site, which ended up not working out, of course, um, I don't think we're ever going to use it. it. It would be at the very end of our run, but um, the number of times we'd use it, we'd be better off just kind of working in agreement with Gray Highlands for a facility that they ran. Uh, and the other thing is we don't even know if Gray Highlands wants that site uh, as far as building a new dome or not. I mean, we've, you know, we've been paying 55% and they've been 45. Um, if, if it's all 100% them, is that still a place they'd want to build? We don't know. So um, that was kind of the big reason why it's kind of stopped here a bit. Uh, and this is just to kind of get the confirmation that we do want to get out of that facility. We don't really need it. Um, and just the fact that it was never a great structure to begin with. You'll even see the picture in the report. Um, the covering was ripped on the air photo. Like it's pro it probably would have been a miracle if we got a picture of it when it wasn't ripped, honestly. Um, so it just, they don't make that kind of structure anymore. It seems like every year we'd get it fixed through our insurance or something every two years. And after the warranty went, it would rip again. And then we do a little repair and then that would rip some more. And uh, just not a great, uh, not a great design and not a great facility, even though the location works very well for Greyhounds, I think. Uh, and even our, our discussion with Greyhound staff, uh, we all agree, basically it's not worth putting any more money into it. You, it's almost unrepairable at this point. Um, so this report is basically to proceed with the sale of the land. Um, the land is registered in our name, but Grey Highlands probably has some stake in it as well. Um, I know Michael knows more about that than I do as far as, you know, the land being registered and who owns it are maybe two different things. So um, we just like to proceed on, on kind of getting out of the structure. Uh, the other thing that has always been an impediment is the agreement is quite peculiar. Um, you know, it mentions about uh, renegotiating I see Paul's hand. Do you want me to keep going or I see Paul's hand up there? You're on mute, Mr. Warden. Sorry about that. I was going to say, I'll, I'll let you finish Pat, and then I'll take. Okay. Paul. So the agreement even mentions a couple strange things like um, based on the yearly use, the ownership would change. Um, we haven't used it since 2012. So by rights, if we had been reviewing it every year, Greyhound should own it now, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of a strange, um, I've never seen an agreement that had that. It, and the agreement seemed to be written like um, we were going to at some point kick Great Highlands out. And uh, then there was some compensation there for them to find a new facility. It really wasn't written with the thought that Gray would ever get out of it. So that, that's always been a struggle with us is the, is the peculiarity of the agreement. Um, and the other thing is I don't believe anyone has any money in their budget to fix it and have a facility operating it there for the winter of 20. 122. So um, that's a struggle. Not It won't be a struggle for Gray, but it might be a struggle for Gray Highlands. I'm just not sure exactly what their plan is with a facility that's, um, you know, kind of mothballed. So um, this is, again, it's just to, to reiterate that we want to meet with Gray Highlands and, and work out uh, an equitable um, adjustment on, on um, what it would cost to get out of that. And then as far as the facility, you know, when we had talked about in 2016, the facility probably was worth something. It was a dome that had a covering that was working at that time. Um, now it's probably worth, you know, it's more expensive to tear down than it is, um, than it is worth, really. So um, it's not like there's a, it's a huge asset there um, because the, the dome is kind of worthless now with the condition it's in. Um, so this is just to continue on with Gray Highlands to uh, work at, uh, work in agreement to get out of there. And it would come back to council anyway. Um, as far as a, a sale. Okay. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, Deputy Warden McQueen. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden, and, and thanks for the report from uh, uh, Pat, Director of Transportation. Yeah, there's a lot of history here uh, before my time, and certainly uh, 
in between the agreement of 2002 was I, I wasn't on council when that new agreement was made with uh, Gray Highlands and Gray County. Certainly, it's a metal structure. It says in the report back to June of 1990 when it was construct constructed. Um, a couple of things uh, throughout this process with that dome, uh, certainly back in around uh, the 2010-2009 time, there was a joint uh, conversation with Gray County and Gray Highlands to, to construct a wood structure. And I know at that time when I was on council, we were setting aside money, and I know the county was as, as well, to look at, obviously, the, the cover was probably seeing its end of its life. And, and I know at that time, both Gray County and Gray Highlands was looking at reconstructing with a wood structure. And I know we had put money aside one or two years. And then from the county's perspective, um, things did change. And, uh, and maybe that goes back to what Pat was saying about uh, maybe the feeling at 2012, they weren't going to need that use of that from that time. And certainly, yes. Um, so then there was the, 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 certainly the damage part that happened. Um, I thought it was around 15, 16, and then the warranty, the warranty of, of that structure was replaced. And the ironic thing is, is that that, that structure, that, that cover went on, I think the first cover they had, they had it inside out or backwards, they had the door in the wrong spot. I think that cover went on four times before they, the, the second that cover finally got, finally buttoned down and, and in place. And, uh, but it, that was a, a warranty thing at the time through through the uh, insurance. And uh, so then back in 17, 18, yeah, there was discussions around the, certainly, and I, I'm glad, Pat, you raised that part about the uh, response times in that area is uh, greater and the conversation around an ambulance play and keeping amb ambience bay and keeping that uh, location for that future location. Conversations we had before in the early 2000s, I guess, maybe 2012, when I guess the county talked about maybe surplusing or, or getting out of it, was in the agreement, and part of, I guess, why it's in that agreement, there's a 36-month termination clause. Problem is, is um, I would think the, the reason why that's, there's 36 months in there is to, to give either party opportunity to look at a, a future site. To suggest that if we look at purchasing this or it's it's given to us for two dollars or whatever, I don't know what we're going to do for this winter or or in the meantime because we have to look at putting money aside for a replacement building as as Great Highlands because you know I don't think there's a, a a solution yet that we don't have winter and winter seems to continue to come and we do need a you know a, the ability to have sand and salt every year, so there's that problem that circumstance around that. Certainly from uh, in the report, it talks about Gray Highlands staff and Gray County staff decided it shouldn't be repaired. None of that conversation has come back to our council. So I like to have that conversation with our staff and council just to determine to hear that part or, or, or look at that cost of, uh, I know uh, Gray County has a separate sand dome in Kimberly. I think it's a canvas or a, a, a cover as well. So there's more than one out there in the sense of, of looking after that part. So my my ask, I guess, Mr. Warden would be is, can we defer even recommendations here to at least have that time to have that conversation with, you know, maybe myself, yourself and our staff, the deputy warden, or sort of the deputy mayor and myself and, and county staff to sort of look at how we go forward. And it just, the problem is, is if we, I don't know what we're going to do as Great Highlands if we don't have that building repaired or have the ability to put sand and salt, because if you, you can't just put sand salt out in the elements because um i'm not sure what happened there but you know yeah. all sand and salt are put in inside and and i guess the other thing is 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 you know is there a future opportunity for still continuing with gray county and and uh, gray highlands like possibly you know eventually if um gray county is looking at a new depot so maybe we partner with gray highlands and gray county on building a new dome like we continue that partnership and and sort of you know the economies of scale of working together at a, at a new future uh, dome site, because obviously both the county and, and ourselves will continue to need sand and salt somewhere. And so, you know, even back when we were sharing the services, we provided the, the backhoe for the county and the, and, the, and the municipality to load that sand and salt 
it certainly, uh, I'll tell you, you put a piece of equipment around salt, it certainly deteriorates it pretty fast. And we found that out as well. So I guess my ask uh, to you, to, to you, Mr. Warden, to County Council is to defer this report for now, to at least have that initial conversation with uh, myself, Deputy Mayor and, and County staff and our CAOs, just to sort of talk through this a little bit more on, and certainly there's a part in that report that uh, talks about our share of, of expenditures, expend, expenditures, which I am unaware that we didn't pay our por portion. And I, I feel that if we, if we owe the county funds, then we need to take that back and, and pay our share. Because if that's what the agreement is, then we need to pay our share on those as well. And that's not fair for the county as well on, on that part. My last comment is I know there was some disposition of uh, sand domes in the last few years of county council. And I know some of them were passed on to the lower tiers for $2. Uh, you know, I think there was one in uh, George and Bluffs and I think there was one maybe in other areas. I have to go back and research through the minutes and stuff where, where they were, but I know there has been, and we've sort of talked about that as well. And uh, I don't know with a site that has had salt on it for many years, what the, you know, what, what aspects of that are as well. I guess it was a, probably at one time, I think it was a bit of a gravel pit where it was, and then it was graded off, and then it was um, made into a, a site for this uh, the sand dome. And you know what? This, the building has worked, has served its purpose over the years. And uh, so, again, Mr. Warden, I just asked if we could see if we can seek a deferral here to have those conversations, uh, because as, as myself, as mayor and council, we're not. We I haven't been involved with those conversations of of the current state of the um, of the sand dome. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Madam Clerk, I'm looking to you and uh, um, suggesting that we proceed with a motion to defer. Actually, moved by uh, Councilor McQueen. Can I go ahead and seek a seconder? Um, with with a deferral for uh, with a motion to deferral, then you're specifically speaking about the deferral only. So, right. I wonder, with um, Councilor McQueen's permission, if we hear what the other members have to say, and then um, proceed, um, if he wishes, with the deferral at that time. I could wait. I, I just think there's there's warrant to have that. I, this is all new for this being brought forward as myself as the head of council for Great Highlands. I just I know it was missed on the report at the last county council. Was it we talked about a number of um, of uh, facilities within uh, Great County within. I know this was off wasn't on that report. And I think the uh, the director said that there was a separate report coming. So this is uh, this is the first I've had any conversation about this report. So. I think for fairness for Gray Highlands, it would be good to have that meeting. So let me just ask, I see two hands. Councillor Desai first, are your comments, can your comments be directed around <clears throat> um, Councillor McQueen's motion to defer or is it on the main uh, motion? I, I, it, would be, it would be a stretch to say that they would be uh, relevant to the deferral, unfortunately. Well, uh, it would depend on whether you would allow them under that debate or not. It, it, it's regarding other uses for that property so then go ahead and make your comments and then um thank you i'll go to the other okay. speakers and ask the same thing sounds good thank you uh so the only question i have is if there was any consideration made that instead of selling the piece of property that uh gray highlands and gray county partner in creating a uh a, a facility not not unlike what we have in markdale where um Gray Highlands has the uh, fire, uh, the fire station, and uh, Gray County uh, paramedics also have a base there. Uh, so we know that there is uh, issues around service times uh, in in that segment or in that uh, quadrant of the municipality. So is, is was consideration provided for that that instead of selling the piece of land, we would repurpose it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Council Mill. Same question. Is yours on the main motion or? more around on the motion to defer. They would be directed to the main motion, sir. Okay, and proceed, please. Thank you. Um, where to start? Um, a few pieces of county infrastructure have generated more discussion than this little sand dome, I am sure of it. And to suggest that Gray Highlands has been surprised by this would be a, I, I, you're not paying attention, Paul. If you think that all of a sudden now we want to have a discussion with the county, I mean, holy mackerel, this has been going on for years. 
We haven't used, the county has not used this, as Pat said, since 2012. We need out of this thing. This is ridiculous to go on like this. Let's sell this to Greyhounds. If it's important to them, they can have it. I'd, yeah, I'd put the toonie on the table if that's what it takes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, next is uh, Councilor Soever. Same question. It's on, well, I guess you're going to speak on the main motion. <laughs> you're muted, sir. Yes, I, I'll speak on the main motion. And, um, you know, I, you know, there's a three year window here from from now to the termination. So I, I think we there's no reason not to get on with the negotiations. And 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 because, I mean, we got three years to figure it out. I mean, if we defer, um, you know, then it only extends the timeline. And, you know, three years would seem to be long enough to figure this out to everyone's satisfaction. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to support the main motion. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest and with your um, support, uh, Madam Clerk, is that we do put uh, councillors, uh, Councillor McQueen, you, you're going to bring a motion to defer. We're going to need a seconder for that. I, I'll be happy to second our word next. Okay, so it's seconded. Now we'll have any discussion that anyone wants to have strictly on the motion to defer. Is there any discussion there? Or are those hands still up, Councillor Decide? Is your hand up on the motion to defer? Oh, no. I apologize, it was up from earlier. No worries. And I don't see, oh, I see one hand. Councillor McQueen, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. And yeah, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we've had this conversation for a number of years, but, you know, I know. Okay. Councilor uh, Millen, when you're a warden, we've had conversations there as well. It's the three, it's the three year termination thing that, uh, that we need time to sort of, I mean, back in 2010, we were setting money aside to build a new one to, to, to prepare for our, ourselves in the county. As uh, is pointed out, the three year, um, the three year termination clause gives us, we got to have time to sort of plan for, you just can't dump it on your, on your yard at your own work yard. It just doesn't work that way unless unless the county is providing sand at, at one of its facilities for, in the meantime until we get a new one planned for or built or whatever. It's just just in the sense of that part of the termination. Um, but, it, you know, if, if the deferral doesn't work, we move forward. I mean, I guess the county at any time can give notice of that three years and then it, you work through those uh, through that part. But it does say in there about a 36 uh, month termination clause and we need time to sort of plan. and. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there's a, there is a responsibility of knowing what to, what's you know to preserve what's there until we can plan to build a new one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. You're next. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And I, I, I was wondering if uh, we could hear Pat had mentioned uh, around the the future uh, possibilities of needing a site for uh, paramedic services. I'm just wondering if we could hear from. Uh, Kevin McNabb around uh, his thoughts on uh, you know that location. I mean, I'd hate to see uh, the sale of a property if uh, there is an expansion, or whether or not it's even a, a potential uh, opportunity there. I'm seeing Thanks. our clerk uh, waving her hand, which means that we're probably <laughs> getting yes. off track. We are. We are speaking strictly to the deferral um, motion. And that's probably more on the main uh, question, Councillor Mackey. So if, if we could- I, uh, I guess I would have liked to have seen us stay on the main question then, Mr. Warden. <laughs> well, we're right now dealing with the motion to defer. Any other comments? Otherwise I will call with yeah, Councillor uh, McQueen. I guess the other part, Mr. Warden is the report, no report has came to count to Great Highlands Council to say it's beyond repair. I mean, there's discussion between staff, but no report has came to council to say uh, we can't repair this for the meantime. And and I guess that's the other part about the deferral is is what's the information or you know is it says there's no contractor left. Well, I know it was repaired a year a year in the previous year because there was a a, a small tear at the top and it was repaired. So I know it's in a spot where we do get a lot of wind and stuff like that. But the thing is, is, is it possibly to be repaired to get it through until we can plan for something else? And I, I just, that's the other part is just to get inf more information from, you know, what is that detail of, of it can't be repaired or it's, it's, it's inhibited to be repaired or it's cost prohibited to be repaired. I, I don't have that information. And I think that's important that we have that information 
as well, not only for Gray County Council, but for our own council too. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Soever. You're muted. Yes, so, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused on the deferral uh, because we got three years to decide on whether it can be repaired or, because or, right now, as I understand, the current agreement is still in effect for another three years, which says that the, the dome will be maintained in good repair and there'll be sand in it. So um, I don't know what, you know, it's not a great agreement for anybody. I, you know, one pagers never are, but um, the, you know, when, when you look at it, I mean, there's seems to be lots of time here. So I don't know why we're want to defer it for another couple of meetings because we've got three years. Thank you, sir. I think we're ready to call the question. Is there anyone <clears throat> opposed to the motion to defer? Raise your hand. So one, two, three, madam. Clerk, you help me? One, two, three, four. It looks like it's defeated, not carried. Okay, now we're back on the main motion, uh, which is the uh, staff recommendation. Uh, and I think we're ready to call the question on that unless people have, oh, um, Pat? Yeah, I could just add a couple things. Um, I just wanted, we could forward that report on about the current uh, state of the structure onto Gray Highlands. And, um, and the other thing I just wanted to add even about the cost sharing, um, it hasn't quite gone 55, 45, but they've paid every bill we've ever sent them. So I just wanted to make sure that was, that was um, public knowledge out there. And the other thing is for the three years, I mean, you know, we wrote a letter in 2018, we wanted out. It's been three years. Like, you know, it was never finalized, um, but you know, whether we have to wait three years from now, like, I don't know if you throw good money after bad just because of a, a, a strange line in a old agreement. I don't know. Anyway, okay, we're ready to move forward either way. So. Ms. Orton, yes. I'm sorry. I wonder if, if Councillor Mackey wants us to go back to his question because we are dealing now with the main <laughs> motion again. Good point. Councillor Mackey? Uh, thanks, Warden. Uh, yes, now that we are back to the main motion, I, I would like to, uh, through you, hear from our Director of Paramedic Services uh, in regards to, uh, you know, the future uh, services in that, uh, that area of Gray County. And because we have been told about the, you know, the response time, you know, that is the one, uh, you know, dark area where the response times are very lengthy and whether or not uh, he feels there's merit uh, in that location or potential merit in that location for a future uh, paramedic site. Thank you. Is Kevin there? Yep, I'm here. Um, can I just share my screen? I, I have a, a picture I can bring up. Sure thing. Can you see that now? Yes. So, so this was prepared by Joel at, uh, for a uh, uh, report from last spring, and we looked at base locations, and uh, Gray Highlands was one of the areas that was identified that, you know, of, of an area to look at in the future for response time enhancements. And also, uh, we looked at an area up in Georgian Bluffs around Cobble Beach. So if you look at the picture in the bottom right corner, um, it, it identifies a, a, a hexagon there. That uh, it, it just it it just slightly uh, north of where the uh, sand dome is, but it's in that general vicinity. So that that's what uh, Joel had done based upon his projections of calls. There's there's not a, a lot of calls out there. I speaking, I think there was like a hundred calls a year in that general area, but it is an area that uh, it, it is a difficult area to access um, as far as like getting there from from different areas. Um, but we I think we are seeing more calls around Lake Eugenia. Uh, but, but again, that is an area that uh, we would look at in the future. Thank you. Anything else, Councillor Mackey? Oh, well, thanks very much, Kevin, for that. I guess my next question would be, is that site possibly suitable for a potential new base? Um, I, I haven't been to the site. I don't even know the acreage or how that would work, but... Uh, generally, you know, 
I, I don't know enough about the particulars, but I know that's been talked about in the future, like as a potential site in the past. Madam CAO. Thank you. Um, I think if we were going to um, really have a good discussion about this, we've also, you know, entertained thoughts of how our models of response are changing and what we're doing with community paramedicine and that. So I think if we were going to um, take a look at dealing with the response times in that area, we would really want to take a fulsome look at um, exactly what was possible and what would be most cost effective. Thank you. Um, are we good, Councilor Mackey? Yes, thanks, Mr. Warden. Okay, Councilor Sewever, you're next. You're muted, sir. Now I'm a bit confused because I just heard um, Director Hoy say uh, that we gave notice in uh, 2018 and looking at the letter, it doesn't appear to say that we're, we're giving notice to made the agreement. And then I see that in the staff report, it actually refers to repairs made to the dome in 2019, which would be after the date of the letter. So um, are, are we taking the position that county gave notice in 2018 through that letter? Because I can't, or is there another letter that gives notice? Um, I'm a bit confused. Uh -huh. I mean, I could just say, like, I'm not a lawyer, right? But um, we've made it pretty clear that we kind of want out. And as the discussions kind of drag on, then the thing would rip, right? So, you know, it is. it was our structure. The majority of it was our structure. We felt like you had to repair it. You can't really hand over a rip structure. We're trying to, you know, we're all trying to work together, Greyhounds and ourselves. Um, and then there, and there also is just that Patrol D depot, um, you know, the kind of the stop and go of, of, of that uh, structure as well. Like we, we've had the same issue with Southgate, you know, Southgate would like to maybe get into Dundalk. You know, we got to keep Dundalk. If we can't build a new depot, MTO might let us get into Flesherton. We don't know. So there is a lot of moving parts that it's hard to really take a stance. I, you know, I'm not trying to be um, difficult or anything. And, and I, and I feel for Greyhounds that they're going to need to figure something out this winter too. Um, whether we work with them at, you know, doing something with Flesherton or I don't know, like we all got to work together and try to get through this winter for sure. Um, but it just is hard from Gray County's point of view to imagine um, putting more into that um, is worth it. And then just, we had talked to Greyhounds recently, their staff, and they kind of said, well, you guys make up your mind and let us know what you're doing, right? So this is kind of what this is about. You know, like um, there's really nothing pushing Greyhounds to do it till we give that notice. I don't know if my letter three years ago um, satisfies the official notice, but um, it's kind of been an ongoing thing. And like I said, I'm not trying to create a fight we're just trying to move it forward. Okay, I'm keeping in mind again, uh, as a chair, that uh, we've had plenty of discussion on this. I'm looking to end it and move on. Uh, uh, Councilor McQueen. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna belabor it. I'm not gonna point fingers at anybody here. I just, I know it did say in the report and I know we, the conversation back in 18 was the, as uh, Councilor Mackey did raise the part that, um, you know, about the idea of, of, a, of another um, outlet for, for uh, ambulance service. And I think that did cause a bit of a pause. I guess the thing that I find a little troublesome is I think it said in the report that it ripped the, the late part of 2020. Well, we're August of 2021. Why didn't this report, or why didn't this come forward like in January or like right away? Like I just, it would have gave us even Gray Highlands more time to, to, figure something out or, or, or even, you know, double look at that, take a, def, a definite look at that repair, if it could be repaired to get us to that, to that point of, obviously we're in a bit of a, a, a catch 22 now is, is where are we, what are we going to do to put our sand and salt or whatever we're going to do? And I, I, I can't speak, I, I have not been included in any of these conversations uh, in the sense that I drive by it. I see the repair. I asked a question what's happening well we'll see what the county do that's the only comments i've had i i don't know any other any other any information so we're in a bit of a you know spot and we do need to work together to, to move forward it just i just find it unfortunate that it happened in the fall of 2020 or the winter of the end of 2020 and we we're almost we we're in the middle of august, of august. we're talking about this so i just i just find you know anyway we'll move forward and we'll have that conversation and we'll see where it goes thank you 
Okay, thank you very much. I think we're ready to call the question. So on the motion uh, to receive this report, to send a uh, notice and to negotiate the purchase sale of land, uh, is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, I'm gonna say that this is carried. Thank you very much, Pat. Okay, we're moving on to item F, the final report of the Boynton uh, Court Subdivision in the town of Blue Mountains. This item has been moved uh, by uh, Councillor Keaveney and seconded by Councillor, oh, am I getting this right? Yeah, I believe it's being moved by Councillor Keaveney and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Have I got that right? Um, no. Um, um, it is uh, 6F, so it's moved by Councillor Hutchinson. Hutchinson and seconded and by Mill. My yes. apologies, your attempts to keep me on track. Uh, <laughs> I'm not cooperating with that. Uh, so we've got uh, Stephanie. Oh, Thank Stephanie. you, Mr. Warden. Uh, good afternoon, County Council. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, everyone can see the presentation? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, before us, we have the final report for a new subdivision application. Um, it's now called Boynton Court, which was formerly, it was formerly known as 61 Alfred Street West when it was initially presented to County Council. Um, the property is located in Thornbury in the town of the Blue Mountains. So the proposed residential development is situated just right here, highlighted in green. Um, through two previous consent applications back in 2019, these two lots were severed and they will now house a single, single detached residential units. Um, the lands to the south, southeast, so fronting onto Orchard Drive are single detached units. Um, the lands to the south, southwest are existing single detached units along Thorncroft Court. Um, west of the subject lands are condominiums, condominium townhouse units locally known as Applejack. So in this area and the town street of Ashbury Court has single detached units right here. Um, as you can note in the red area, this is a community center. Um, as well, this is a large sports field. So the property is within walking distance, which is fantastic for future residents of this area um, for access. The lots would gain access um, through, through um, new, a new municipal cul-de-sac, which would be coming off of Victoria Street South, just down here. Um, and the lands will be fully serviced, um, municipal servicing, so water and sewer. So the draft plan before us, we have, so this is Victoria Street, just for orientation. Um, this is Alfred Street West. So the proposed subdivision will have 18 total units. There will be 10 semi-detached units. They run along here and two townhouse blocks. So block six and block seven will be townhouse blocks and they will house eight townhouse units. And those will be um, created as separate standalone units later on through the process through part lot control. So as you can observe, the semi-detached units abut the single detached lots in behind. So the neighbors have single detached lots. And we've, we've looked at having the higher density portions of this development abutting Alfred Street West. The lot density of the development is 20.45 units per net hectare. So it's, it's meeting the threshold of what the county official plan requires within this primary settlement area of Thornbury as 20 units per net hectare as a minimum. This proposal also requires an amendment to TBM zoning bylaw. This was enacted and passed July 12th, 2021 and a holding symbol was applied to these lands through this process. Conditions for removal of this holding symbol include execution of a subdivision agreement with the town, registration of a plan of subdivision, and municipal water and sanitary sewage capacity confirmed as available to service this de development. 
Several technical studies have been submitted with this application, posted on the website and circulated to various agencies, such as Applying Justification Report, Archaeological Stage 1-2, Traffic Impact Study, Functional Servicing and Stormwater Management, and Phase 1 Environmental Site Assessment. So the virtual public meeting was held back in September of September 30th, 2020. Um, verbal comments were received from two couples, so four individuals in total at the public meeting, and county also received written comments from nine individuals. The comments received verbally and in, in writing uh, spoke to concerns about proposed drainage and stormwater. Um, that initiated further review by town staff. Um, county also reviewed and, and as well with the consulting engineer, and it was determined and deemed that the proposed drainage is consistent with the Thornbury West drainage master plan. There are also concerns related to sidewalks and traffic. Um, it was recognized that 18 homes are not anticipated to have a negative impact on town road infrastructure as per the traffic impact study findings. Um, it's also noted that Victoria Street South um, is to be reconstructed by the town soon. So it, it was noted in, within the next couple of years. Um, and at that time, local council may choose at, at that time to include the provision of sidewalks on either one or both sides of that street. A street crossing will also be assessed at that time, crossing Alfred Street West. There were concerns about the results of the phase one ESA. Um, so a bit of background, this property was previously used as an orchard. So there was the potential for pesticide use. Um, and so through the phase one ESA, it was deemed that a phase two ESA is will be required and completed prior to any further development and a record of site condition may be required. There were concerns about um, neighborhood character and compatibility. Um, so in this regard, the, the semi-detached units are proposed, again, adjacent to the existing single detached units, which have the same maximum zoning heights. Um, I think this is a, a really great approach to trying to, to mitigate some of those concerns where the semis are proposed as bungalow style. Um, each unit will have its own driveway. There are also concerns with regards to tree retention. Tree inventory and preservation plan have been recommended as part of the draft plan conditions. There were concerns related to public growth. Many parts of the county are experiencing significant growth pressures. Blue, Blue Water School District indicate, indicated that on all offers of purchase and sale, that accommodation within a public school um, may not be guaranteed. Um, and that's just the nature of, of growth and development at this stage in, in the county and specifically in Thornbury. Um, so students may be housed in temporary facilities. The comments received from agencies, um, Bell Canada, I request that the, the owner developer connect with them during the detailed design to confirm the provision of communication and telecommunication infrastructure. Uh, Bruce Telecom has no interest in the subject development. Canada Post, um, it will be served, this development will be served through PO Box system and, and it will be located at the Thornbury Post Office. Grey Boost Health Unit, no concerns. Uh, Grey County Transportation, um, had requested a 10 meter daylight triangle for sightline purposes at the intersection of Victoria Street South and Alfred Street West, as well as a 0.3 meter road reserve to limit any further access laneways to the subject development in the future. Historic Sogging, Métis, no objection or concerns. Um, Enbridge as well, they've requested um, the developer connect with them at the time to, uh, at the, as they proceed through the, the development process to ensure um, gas services are adequately connected to the development. Grace Level Conservation Authority, no concerns. This isn't within the CA regulated area. Um, Blue Water District School Board um, had, had some comments. Um, again, just like to flag. So as part of the offers of purchase and sale, um, they're advising that a statement be included to pr prospective purchasers that the accommodation within a public school in the community is not guaranteed and that students may accommodated in temporary facilities. Um, so it was noted that school buses do not enter cul-de-sac, so school bus pickup would be along the through road, which would be Victoria Street South in this case. 
um, a sidewalk along Victoria Street th South was um, recommended and a street crossing to be installed at Al Alfred Street West. And with regards to Town of Blue Mountains, um, the local municipality passed the zoning bylaw amendment July 12th. So an analysis of, of planning related matters took place for this application. Um, the subject lands in the county official plan are designated primary settlement area. And that's where, as per the official plan, we encourage uh, residential, resident, residential growth because there are infrastructures there to support um, residents. Um, as well in the town official plan, these lands are designated community living areas. Similarly, um, it's intended for residential growth. These lands will be serviced by municipal servicing, um, both sewer and water, and the, these lands will also connect to existing town infrastructure for stormwater purposes. Um, the development supports a mix of housing styles, so semi-detached and townhouse units. Um, a phase two ESA will be completed prior to any further works on these lands. Um, as well, county, the town, and the school board will, will connect and review the inclusion of uh, sidewalks and, and street crossings in this location to ensure safe um, and walkable, walkable facilities for future residents. So with that, uh, staff are the opinion that the proposed development has regard for matters of provincial interest under the Planning Act, is consistent with the PPS, conforms with the county OP, and conforms with the town of the Blue Mountains OP. And staff are recommending that the subject report be received, that all written and oral submissions received on the plan of subdivision were considered, the effect of which helped make an informed recommendation and decision, and that the Gray County Committee of the Whole approves the plan of subdivision subject to the conditions set out in the notice of decision. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions or yeah, provide any clarification. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, Council, are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Potter. Whoops, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, um, we've begun uh, approaching developers about uh, installing conduit for future internet purposes uh, in all subdivisions, which would then be turned over to the town the same as any other infrastructure. Uh, would the county be involved in that in any way that you know of? Or is that strictly something that the town would be doing? Um, through you, Mr. Warden, I, I might defer if, if Randy's on the call, um, might defer to him in, in that respect. I'm not certain how, um, yeah, those conversations would take place. Yeah, excellent question. Thank you, Councillor Potter, and through you, Mr. Warden. Um, we do have uh, policies in, in Recolor Gray that uh, support looking at uh, the ability to put in conduit in, as part of either new developments or road construction projects and things of that nature. So if it involves a county road, um, no doubt we'd be involved or would love to be involved as part of those discussions for sure. Um, and anything with respect to the development as well, we'd be happy to uh, work with the town and other municipalities to um, include language. It's something that could be addressed as part of the subdivision agreement. Um, if there's um, a sufficient wording that's that's worked out with the developer, in this case, this particular developer to, to install that conduit. So we'd be happy to have those conversations. There was some previous work by by, done by some uh, other municipalities in Ontario. And, uh, and so we've done some background research that we could uh, bring to the table as well uh, to, to add to the conversation. So we'd be happy to be involved in those discussions for sure. Yeah, there are certainly lots of municipalities that are already doing this. So uh, we, uh, it's a lot uh, easier and less expensive to do it at this stage uh, through the subdivision agreement, as you say, than it is to do it later on once everything's built. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. So with that said, I'm going to call the question on the motion to receive, to acknowledge the public uh, input and to approve the plan of subdivision subject to uh, certain conditions. Is there anyone opposed to the motion? Seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, next is item uh, 6G. Uh, we're dealing with the Bruce subdivision in West Gray. 
Um, that puts Scott on deck. It's moved by Councillor Keaveny and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Scott, you have the floor. All right, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Warden and members of council. I am just going to share my screen here and then we will get underway. Uh, so can people see the title slide of the presentation there now? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so what we're dealing with today is the Bruce subdivision, and this is a subdivision in the northeast end of Durham. Uh, you can see it on your screen there highlighted in blue, and, and the lands are about 13.7 uh, hectares in size. Uh, these lands were added to the urban settlement area in, uh, in 2012, uh, along with the lands to the immediate west, and those are the, the Sunvale subdivision. And the Sunvale subdivision, sorry, has been approved um, and it's currently under construction. And although on that map, you only see lot lines for, for a portion of the property, uh, that's because they're registering the subdivision in phases, but that entire property uh, with, with the horse track on it has been approved. And, and uh, if you've driven through Durham lately, is, is very actively under construction and there's lots of homes being built there. So the proposal in front of us today is for up to 205 residential units. There would be 118 single detached dwellings. Uh, and then depending on how the multi-unit blocks develop out, there would be up to 87 townhouse dwellings. Uh, included in the subdivision will also be a, a parkland block and there will be stormwater management facilities. And if we go back to this map here, Actually, we'll show, show it on the next map, sorry. Um, there will be access to the subdivision in, in three main points right now. There'll be two accesses off of Durham Road East, uh, and then there'll be an extension from, from the west of Jackson Street, uh, which will come through the Sunvale subdivision and, and takes you right back out to, uh, to Highway 6 in that regard. Uh, there's also being planned a future access to the north, should those lands ever be added to the settlement area and developed in that regard. Uh, these lots will be serviced with full municipal water and sewer services. And uh, as per usual with any plan of subdivision, there's been a number of studies and technical reports that were submitted uh, to the county and the municipality and were reviewed by, by agencies and the public in this regard. Uh, I should also note that a zoning amendment is also being processed by the municipality of West Gray, uh, and that was done in concert with the subdivision, but a decision has not yet been rendered on the zoning. I did want to take some time just to point out that this was the original plan of subdivision that we received, uh, both West Gray and the county. And uh, uh, there was lots of pros to the subdivision, but one of the things that we heard uh, resoundingly from, from uh, uh, the municipality and, and members of the public is, is that there was no parkland here. Uh, another one of the comments we got was that, uh, that there was no future connection to the north should that ever be uh, needed. Uh, so the developer was great to work with and they actually revised their plan a few different times um, at the behest of, of county and municipal staff. And, and what you see before you on this next slide um, is, is the plan we're putting forth today for, for draft plan approval. And what you will see is that Street A is extended to the north, so that would give that northerly access should those lands be added. Uh, and then there is a large parkland block uh, in the northeast end of the section, and that represents about 4.75% of, of the property. Uh, so for, for the 5% parkland dedication, they could, they could use this block and for that remaining 0.25%, there could be cash in lieu added there. Um, I should also note that uh, what you see mostly are the single detached dwellings, uh, and then these kind of open blocks in the center of the development uh, would be where we have our townhome development, our townhouses. And I should note that it's important to, to show that the, the singles over here in the parkland and, and the singles down here um, were strategically located. Uh, and that was to, to help minimize the impact on neighbors um, versus if we had uh, a larger density along the periphery. So they, they purposely put some of the bigger lots and, and bigger units around the periphery to buffer it to some of these large singles in the south, uh, as well as to the, the uh, um, lands to the east here. Sorry, we did have comments from a number of members of the public and the agencies, and I can say uh, at this stage, there's no outstanding agency comments and, and uh, the municipality of West Gray uh, also gave us their recommended draft plan conditions. Uh, there were some comments and concerns from member of the members of the public, and I'm just going to go through those in greater detail here now. Um, so we had some concerns about traffic and there was concerns about uh, both vehicular and pedestrian access. 
um, both on Durham Road and, and uh, to neighboring lands, including the Sunvale subdivision and back out to the highway. There was a traffic impact study conducted with this development, and, and that was actually done um, by the same consultant that did the Sunvale traffic impact study. So they were factoring in the traffic from, from both uh, developments, not just the current traffic. Um, and that, that study was reviewed by municipal staff as well as their own municipal peer reviewer. Um, with respect to the pedestrian access, there will be uh, sidewalks within most of the development. Uh, and there's also plans for future sidewalks on Durham Road East, which is the main road connecting this development. We also heard concerns with respect to both impacts on the environment and concerns about tree removal. Uh, we did have an environmental impact study that was connect conducted for this development, which was reviewed by county and municipal staff, as well as the Conservation Authority and the Municipal Peer Reviewer. Uh, there are recommendations in that document that require uh, some tree retention, and there will be both a tree retention plan and a landscape plan uh, required as, as uh, draft plan conditions to this development. There was comments about uh, would this, uh, this proposed development have any impact on uh, drinking water source protection and, and municipal wells in that regard. Uh, the subject lands are uh, predominantly outside of the wellhead protection areas. There is a very small portion of wellhead protection area E in the northeast corner, uh, and that's actually under what will be what will in the future be the municipal park. Uh, so there's no further concerns with respect to impacts on the municipal wells in this regard. Uh, there was concerns over infrastructure and whether or not uh, uh, servicing in the area and other infrastructure would be capable of uh, supporting this development. In working with uh, West Gray staff and their peer reviewer, they have noted that there will be some upgrades needed. And as I said, there, there are some upgrades planned already on, on uh, Durham Road East uh, with respect to improving the servicing and the sidewalks there. Um, but in the end, through the conditions of draft approval and, and the phased improvements that were already planned for this area, uh, staff and the peer reviewer felt that the infrastructure is, is suitable there. I should also note that uh, uh, water and sewer capacity will be allocated at the time of draft plan approval here. Uh, we also heard concerns with respect to potential for stormwater management or, or uh, uh, flooding issues in this area. And certainly given what Councillor Robinson uh, shared with us over the weekend, this is certainly a very pertinent topic. Um, there were uh, stormwater management plans done that were reviewed by the peer reviewer, the municipality and the conservation authority. Um, they all deemed the, the preliminary stormwater management work to be complete and there'll be fin final work completed as part of the draft plan conditions. Uh, the final stormwater facility will of course also need to be approved by the, uh, the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. As I noted earlier, there was concerns about the lack of parkland, but that's now been added to the plan. Um, we heard concerns about light pollution from the neighbors and wanting to make sure that the future street lights here were, were dark sky compliant. Um, in chatting more uh, specifically with West Gray on staff on this, they noted that they don't have any approved municipal engineering standards at this point um, that would specifically address this, but we can add wording in the subdivision agreement to look at uh, what those future light standards will look like. Um, and uh, the developer has noted they're, they're certainly more than happy to provide uh, dark sky compliant lighting as long as that map meets any municipal requirements in that regard. Uh, we also heard concerns about the potential for privacy and, and trespass issues and, and certainly um, you know, with a development of this size on, on the surrounding neighbours, there will be less privacy, uh, but we can look at things through the subdivision agreement, including fencing along parts of the periphery uh, to minimise um, some of those privacy issues and, and minimise uh, impacts of, of uh, uh, potential legal trespass in that regard. We're getting near the end here, but we did also hear uh, concerns over the impact on farming. And uh, these lands, as I said, are in the settlement area. They're designated for growth in both the municipal and county official plans. Um, but there's no doubt anytime we're developing on the periphery of the settlement area, if there's, if there's nearby farms, there could be the potential for conflict there. I would note that West Gray has been proactive here and for a number of years now, those neighboring farms have been zoned with a restrictive zoning uh, such that no new livestock facilities can be built there uh, and no further uh, livestock expansions can be built there. Um, but certainly there, there is potential for, for impacts on, on uh, neighboring operations. At this stage, the neighboring operations are generally uh, cash crop in nature. And finally, we heard concerns about um, whether or not the healthcare system is, is capable of uh, supporting these new residents. And that's a really interesting concern. And, and it might be a factor of, of us uh, going out to public consultation in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, but under the Planning Act, uh, we as planning staff and municipal planning staff are required to circulate a number of agencies from school boards to conservation authorities to utilities. 
Interestingly enough, one of those required agencies is, is there's there's no healthcare sector agencies in those uh, in those requirements. We do, as a matter of practice, circulate the Grey Bruce Health Unit. Uh, they normally always get us comments, but because we're in the middle of a global pandemic, they've got other things on their plate at the moment. Um, but it's it's a comment that we've taken and, and we want to discuss further going forward as to whether or not we should go above and beyond those provincial requirements and look at involving uh, the healthcare sector more actively in our plans and it might not be on a development by development basis, uh, but it might be on bigger picture initiatives like the growth management strategy so that they can equally prepare for, for the, uh, the wave of growth that's hitting uh, uh, the county in this regard. So with that being said, um, county staff are satisfied that the, the um, development meets the requirements of, of the county and municipal plans. Um, it does uh, meet or exceed the 20 units per net hectare requirement, uh, similar to what uh, Stephanie shared in her report. And it is providing a mix, mix of single detached dwellings and, and townhomes. And certainly with the, the comments we got from agencies and the comments we got from, from the public, it definitely changed this development. And I would say uh, made for a better development with the inclusion of the parkland block for sure. And we're satisfied that with the conditions of draft approval, uh, the matters of provincial interest under the Planning Act have had regard for. It is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to uh, both applicable official plans in that regard. Um, so with that said, uh, staff recommendation is that the report be received um, and that uh, the committee consider uh, draft approving this development for a total of up to uh, 205 um, dwelling units in this regard. So that's all I have at this stage, but certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Scott. Council, any questions here? If there are no questions, then I'm going to thank Scott for the presentation. And on the, I'll call the question on the motion to receive, to acknowledge the public input, and to approve the plan of subdivision subject to conditions. Anyone opposed to that motion? Seeing none, I'm going to say that that is approved as well. Thank you very much, Scott. We're going to move on uh, to item 6H, which puts uh, Jill on deck, <clears throat> dealing with uh, Grey Roots General Store sponsorship. And uh, it's moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Jill, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and good afternoon, members of Council. Um, in July of 2021, staff at Grey Roots Museum and Archives were approached by Fairmont Security Services to propose funding support for the building of a replica general store in Morriston Heritage Village. Uh, you may remember that earlier this year, Fairmont sponsored the development of Zuz's Place, the upcoming children's gallery uh, at Grey Roots. In this current proposal, Fairmont Security Services generously offered the amount of 40,000 over the course of uh, five years, so 8,000 per year. Mr. Thomas Wielden, Chief Executive Officer of Fairmont Security Services, has a personal interest in, the, in supporting the general store at Morriston Heritage Village because his own grandparents, Richard and Jesse Wielden, were the proprietors of the general store in Arnott, Ontario from the 1920s to just after the Second World War. For the duration of the proposed agreement, the sponsorship of the general store will be recognized through the installation of a plaque inside the store to distinguish the grandparents of Thomas Wielden as the proprietors and acknowledge the financial contribution of Fairmont Security. Pending council approval, the replica general store will also be named the Arnott General Store in further recognition of Mr. Wielden's family history, which perfectly aligns with the time period depicted at Morriston Heritage Village. Um, due to the generosity of the sponsorship amount, staff recommend the name be maintained for a period of 10 years, starting in 2022, when the general store opens to the public. The connection to Gray County towns like Arnott creates an interpretive opportunity to discuss the changes that have come to rural towns and the importance of general stores as community hubs. Gener uh, Gray Root staff interviewed Mr. Wielden's father, Francis Wielden, in order to document his first at hand experiences with the family run store. Opportunities to showcase the video recording at Gray Roots will be explored. Additionally, uh, Thomas Wielden had arranged for the video to be produced by uh, CTRE Productions. Staff are keen to recognize the generous sponsorship and are pleased to be able to honor the important work of the Wielden family at the general store in Arnott. In accordance with um, the corporate asset naming policy, uh, county council approval is required in the naming, renaming of 
Gray County buildings. The naming of a county asset may be considered when providing recognition for sponsorships. And before I close, I just quick status update on the general store in Morriston. Uh, we now have a foundation, the basement is complete, and we're hoping to see framing work uh, starting next week. So it'll be really exciting to see that progress um, in the next coming weeks. Um, so through this report, we are asking that the warden and clerk be authorized to sign a sponsorship agreement with Fairmont Security Services, and that Morriston Heritage Village General Store be named the Arnott General Store for the sponsorship period of 2022 to 2032. Thank you very much, Jill. Council, any questions? I do not see any questions. Jill, thank you very much for that uh, report. This is actually quite exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, coming along. Um, yep. So I will I will call the question then on the motion to receive, on the motion to sign a, a sponsorship agreement, and to name uh, the Morriston Heritage uh, Village General Store, uh, Arnott General Store. Uh, is there anyone opposed to that motion? That's carried. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jill. Thank you. Okay, so council, I'm going to suggest that we uh, entertain the motion to uh, go into closed session and then we take a short break. Uh, Mr. Warden, yeah. I'm sorry, we do have two oh, items we have that two were pulled items, yes. from consent, yeah. yes. My apologies. Okay, <clears throat> let me go back here. We are dealing first of all with item uh, 5C and the development, let me see here. Development charges steering committee minutes. Yes. So, Councillor Soever, I believe, had some questions there, didn't you? We will need a mover and seconder, oh. sir, to put that on the floor first. No worries. I'm going to say move by Councillor Soever. Would you be okay with that? I'm thinking you're nodding, but I did see uh, Deputy Warden McQueen's hand. I'm going to perhaps say that he seconded. Are you okay with that, Council Swever? Yes. Okay, you have the floor, sir. Okay, uh, the reason I pulled this um, was the, in, in the minutes here, um, we, we did receive this report and I understand it was discussed um, last uh, at the last council meeting as well, um, that unfortunately I couldn't attend. Um, but, and I don't know, some of you may have seen my correspondence with Mr. Scherzer of uh, the, the last few weeks, during last week, when I became aware of a, um, a, an article in the Owen Sound Sun-Times, which indicated that Southgate staff uh, were predicting 100% growth over the next 20 years and not the 48%, uh, which is in our study. And, um, the Southgate suggests 3,000 of the 4,170 4, residents projected by Hemsum over the next 25 years are already in the development pipeline for the next um, just five years, not the 25. So we're getting 3,000, according to them, already in the pipeline are 3,000 of the four. 4,170 that are projected by Hemson over 25 years. So I was questioning why there's, uh, you know, such a difference. And uh, Mr. Scherzer was kind enough to tell me that there had been um, good consultation with the uh, Southgate staff um, and that these things would be updated. But I just thought that County Council, um, if they missed that in the email exchange, um, whoops, my video had turned off, I guess. Let me see if I can get it back on. Oh, there we go. Um, yes, uh, sorry about that. Somehow it went off there. Um, the, yeah, so, you know, why there's such a, a large difference, and I just thought I'd like to highlight for council that there, there is quite a range of differences. Now, I, I do understand that if we're underestimating growth, as, as we may appear to be doing, at least in the opinion of Southgate, that that will just mean that we'll probably overcharge on development charges. But um, just wanted to bring that to the attention of council. Okay, 
I didn't really hear a question, but um, it's more of a, a statement. Well, I just want to understand, like, our, which number are we going to use? I, I presume we're using the county number, I guess. Is Randy? Yeah, thank you. And uh, through you, Mr. Warden, and thank you for your question, Councilor Swever. Um, with respect to uh, obviously the growth projections and allocations, um, yeah, based on what uh, committee and council has supported uh, earlier today is that we'd be moving forward with at least uh, um, a housekeeping amendment to our official plan to incorporate uh, the new growth projections and allocations that Hemson has developed uh, on, on our behalf. And um, we have had uh, multiple discussions uh, and, and, and did provide multiple draft versions of those growth projections and allocations over the last few months to local municipal staff for review and comment. And, uh, and, and through those reviews and comments, uh, there were revisions made to the, the latest growth uh, growth manager. So I don't know the uh, the era, I guess, of 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 the uh, the projections that were reported in the in the um, newspaper article that uh, uh, that Council Swever noted. But uh, we have definitely had some further discussions with with uh, for sure Southgate staff uh, regarding uh, those projections, and and from our understanding, they're satisfied with. Uh, the latest growth projections that have been put forward and uh, um, as as noted in my email if you know we're not aware of any other uh, outstanding uh, matters uh, with respect to that but that's part of the housekeeping amendment there'll be further consultation with uh, local municipalities as well as the community as a whole uh, and uh, we'll ha be happy to receive those comments and have those discussions as part of that process. And uh, if there's yeah any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact uh, county staff. We'd be happy to have those discussions for sure. Thank you, Councilor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I was just no going to note that if you read it in the paper, it's got to be true. Okay, moving along. I think we can... Uh, Councilor Swab, are you satisfied? We can call the question. Yes, yes. I'm just Denmark? wondering, if maybe, maybe uh, Deputy, whoops, maybe Deputy Mayor Mill, uh, Councilor Mill, could could tell me is the 3,000 units in the development pipeline at present uh, a correct number? I would say it's close. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call the question on the motion as presented. Is there anyone opposed? Oh, oh, sorry. sorry, I see Miss uh, Councillor McQueen's hand. I'm being a little too pushy, am I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Deputy Ward McQueen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Ward, and I did raise the part of, of this yeah. item as well. Uh, the point I'm raising, and just for clarity, is it talks about in there of the 2015 Transportation Master Plan. And as I understand, council only received that, but I don't really remember it being endorsed because there was recommendations that were being made in there and other alignments of roads, which still to this day hasn't um, materialized. And I, I guess the question is, is um, it was it, it's a bit of a roadmap, wasn't fully endorsed by county council. So I guess there's any is there any clarity in the sense of of using it as a, a as a, a full document other than a, a guideline i guess maybe that's what it's being considered i'm not sure because there are some there were some realignments of a lot of different roads that had been talked and there was some other things that i don't think uh, county councilors were really keen on uh, was the downloading of a number of roads but i think that was one of the reasons why it maybe was just received and not endorsed but but there were some there were some uh discussions in that report also about realignments and future work so if there's any comment there mr warden or not <clears throat> yeah, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, and yeah, you're correct, Councilor McQueen. Is is uh, the 2015 transportation master plan was received, and and part of the reason why it was just received was uh, it was a result of the recommendations from the consultant regarding road rationalizations, which wasn't supported by council at that time because uh, there was a number of transfers being recommended. Uh, based on the level of service of those roads being providing a more local service versus a, a what we call 
or classify as a county road service. Um, however, there were a number of actions that uh, that council did support and recommendations in the transportation master plan that were uh, supported by council and, and staff were directed to move forward with those actions, which I know uh, Director Pat is is working on uh, implementing some of those. We've implemented some of those through our Recolor Gray, our, our official plan, uh, and we're also using those those actions that were supported by council at that time to form the basis for studies such as this, uh, when we're looking at what other capital improvements or upgrades uh, are coming down the pipeline, so to speak. In, in in this case, in order to support future growth and development as it relates to development charges, um, so we are using a good portion of that uh, that study because a good portion of that was supported by council and as you noted the road racization was the only piece that really wasn't supported by council at that time um, but all the other great stuff in that transportation master plan was uh, uh, supported uh, in through uh, actions that were uh, supported by council and and staff uh, direction was provided that time um, so we with respect to that, it was, you know, it was noted that it is six years old, that 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 document and some of those actions, but we have uh, now, of course, now a 10-year capital plan. So we've incorporated the most latest version of the 10-year capital plan as part of the DC capital program. Um, we've also uh, recognized that beyond 10 years, it gets a little bit fuzzier, a little gray area in terms of what actually will likely be required in uh, post 10 years. So we've included funding envelopes in some of our categories in our uh, DC capital plan to try to account for stuff that we may not be aware of at this stage, but could be aware of uh, as part of future updates to the DC background study or as through future updates to the transportation master plan. So that's how we've incorporated uh, some of those uh, some of those things uh, as part of this draft DC capital program anyways. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I do not see any other hands now. So perhaps it's time for us to indeed call the question on motion uh, before you. Is there anyone opposed? No one being opposed. I'm going to say that that is carried. We're moving on to item 5G, um, which is the Town of Blue Mountains uh, uh, resolution. I'm looking for a mover to put it on the floor. Moved by Councillor Potter, seconded by, don't be shy. I Councilor think Potter. I I'll second. <laughs> I was looking at twitches. <laughs> okay, Councillor Suever then. Fair enough. Uh, Councillor Suever, you have the floor. Yes, I just wanted to highlight to Council and, and probably explain uh, the, this resolution that um, that the Council of the Blue Mountains receives with disappointment the June 30th, 2021 correspondence so, um, from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs of Housing um, with regards to the, the, the that was the grant uh, for the uh, waste management study. Um, you know, it, we, we did discuss that under our, um, you know, previously at our County Council and uh, council was uh, somewhat distressed that we weren't following the collaborative framework on this. And um, then, um, you know, when the funding came through from the province, uh, council members had watched the uh, deliberations of county council on this uh, application and uh, informed themselves. And they, you know, they couldn't believe that the province would give money when it was quite clear from the conversations at county council that there was little, if, if this was, was not, this was an application to get some provincial money, but, but there was, didn't seem to be, um, you know, confirmed support and that the timeline seemed rather tight. And I, I do note that in the, when we did apply at county council, as a council for this, we acknowledged under uh, section E of the application, the publicly posted, uh, the requirement for a publicly posted report by November 30th, which, you know, we've now acknowledged that wasn't even possible. So I don't, you know, I think that that explains why um, our council, you know, we, we don't, we, we certainly support the county getting money from the province, but, you know, we, we just feel that uh, it should be done for things that, um, you know, are done properly. And so 
that's the explanation of that. So if anybody was confused why the words with disappointment are in that motion, um, and then I'd move that we do receive it for information unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, sir. Um, Adam CAO. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm disappointed, Councillor Soever, that you feel that this wasn't done properly, since I think we all try our very best to conform to the rules and regulations and processes that the province provides to us. You'll recall that this application was submitted in February, and we were supposed to have a response in May. So we received the response at the end of June. So when the timelines change, it's very difficult for the outcomes not to be adjusted accordingly. And that's what's happened here. You'll likely be pleased to know that the resolution that this council passed asked that um, the project due date be extended to February 18th. We've now been informed that everyone who asked for an extension um, is to, um, the TPAs will come out with a January 30th deadline on them. So that doesn't conform with what this council passed. So according to the resolution that we passed, we'll be putting the cost of looking at a waste management feasibility study in the 2022 budget. Any other uh, comments? And I will call the question on the motion to receive. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that is carried. Okay, we are now down to item number uh, seven. Uh, we're about to go into closed session. It is moved uh, by the councillor body. And by the way, we will take a break after we just go into closed session because I'm sure that some people need to have a little break. Mr. Uh, Warden, yes. I'm sorry. I wonder if we recess prior to going into closed and then we come back and, and move a resolution to go into closed session. Absolutely, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we take a short uh, recess. It's now what seven minutes before. So at five minutes past uh, three, so three o five. If we come back, we'll see you all then.
Mr. Borden, I will let you know that Councillor Hutchinson has left the meeting. Thank you. Okay, it says five past. Olivia, how are we making out? There we go. All good. Okay, am I good to go, Madam Clerk? Yes. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, item seven says we are now going to go into uh, closed session. It's moved by Councillor Body, who's here, and Councillor Clumpus is also here. Um, that we go into closed session for advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege and with respect to personal matters involving identifiable individuals. Is there anyone opposed to that uh, motion? Seeing none, that's carried. We'll take a second just to make sure that uh, only the people who need to be here are here. So Mr. Warden, for the people staying in will be our CAO, um, Kevin McNabb, Anne-Marie Shaw, Michael Letourneau, Jacqueline Morrison, um, Jennifer Moreau, Kathy, myself, and Olivia. People will um, leave after certain items. Very good, thank you. And Olivia, you can let me know when I'm good to go. Okay, it'll be one moment. We're going to be off of live. 